Yes. Hmm. Yes. Speaking of opening. Opening the box of delight. Fun. We're, op- we're opening Good the... Night, um, Mr. Tom. We're opening the Pandora's box of Doctor Who today. Yay. The yes. Pandora car, if ah- you will. Ahead of the release of... Drew. The new series of Doctor Who. The Drew series the, um, of Doctor Who. Uh, this is the big damn cast. Uh, I am... Uh, Chris Gallifrey Falls Johnson. <laughs> and I am Matthew No More Watson. <laughs> that sounds bleak, actually. Yeah, it's, it's like true. A... It's... Gallifrey Falls No More. I'm a nihilist. It's exhausting. Oh, God. Um, or, or a hero because of it, if you're a Rick and Morty fan. Mm. Either way, we'll cut off your Johnson. Um, so I pickle. No. <laughs> um, Did you watch Movie Bob's thing about yes. your pickle? Rick? It's great, great, really good. It's great. Um, so, if you're listening to this, yes, we're in the past. Yes, which we always are technically when this comes out. But we're further in the past than we usually are. We are time traveling two weeks into the future. Yes, to speak to you. Uh, and shortly after we recorded episode one hundred and seventeen. Which Jesus. was two days ago for us, two weeks ago for you guys listening to it. Yeah. Um, we had just talked about Captain Marvel trailer, the Stan and Ollie trailer, and the Mary Poppins Returns trailer. Yeah. Less than 24 hours later, Doctor Who goes and drops a bloody trailer. Yeah. <laughs> now... And a great trailer as well. A damn fine trailer. And a that... proper, like, oh, this is actual bits of dialogue and stuff from episodes Snippets trailer. of visuals to give us more yeah. of, a, of a clue as to what's happening. And yet still held back on showing any monsters or specific conflicts. Yeah. Which I respect so much because we know nothing. And I love that. But we, we now have more of a taste and who, more of a flavour. Who's in charge? She is. <laughs> who says? Us. Now, as, as, of the, as of this recording, as of this recording, it's not been answered yet, but uh, Doctor Who's official Twitter account put out a picture. Like shortly after the trailer, a screen grab from the trailer. There's a, a character, picture. yeah, a character obscured by uh, the Doctor in the foreground. Uh, this character's in the background, and they they just put who's that, like with the Doctor or something like that. It's and, Nardo. <laughs> but and also some people have, have think they recognise the American voice in the trailer that says like, you know, why are we listening to her or whatever it is. Uh, so the rumours are abound at the minute that Matt LeBlanc is playing a character in one of the episodes. Yeah, all right. Which I'm down for. Oh, that's right. pretty cool. And it's not like he's not been in UK television for a bit. He's yeah, been he's very right. much all up in that his A. He's been doing episodes for God knows how long. Yeah, and Top Gear for two series and then buggering off. Yeah, uh, um, poor Top Gear. No, so, not poor Top no, Gear. Not poor Top Gear. Top Gear. Um, and, you know, I've, I, have a, I have a soft spot for classic Top Gear, but not in a way where I'm like, these guys are great. I'm like, these guys are dicks. They're bellens. But there is something entertaining when they are self-contained and only interacting with each other. Yeah. Like, you then I'm any, like, that's fine. You put anyone else in that group and you're just like, oh, why are these people being awful to these people? Plus, star in a reasonably priced car was always fun. Yes. Um, Who could forget Gambon Corner? <laughs> Love it. Anyone who's just listened to the last 30 seconds of this going, oh, they're just slugging off Top Gear is like, but they've definitely watched it. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah. Um, Royce. Uh, Roy, that trailer's pretty damn sweet, and we're really excited. And to talk about it, I'm now, excited. To talk about it now in depth would be redundant, considering you guys have probably listened to a thousand other people talk about it in the last fortnight. But you we will say busy, this: busy, busy bees. But we will say this: um, love the use of contemporary music for the trailers. Gives it yes. a different feel. It's kind of on the nose, but I don't care because it's definitely appealing to people like me. Which is that gorgeous line in the song that says, it got a chance to start again. Yeah, it is a fresh start. It which be is a fresh which start. is interesting, because it's almost like the BBC are going, yeah, 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 we admit the last bit was a misstep. So that's kind of, uh, that's kind of wonderful. Um, I know that some people find the music jarring a little bit, but I don't care. It's a trailer, mate. It's a trailer. Uh, it's and, a trailer. Also, and also, it's still saving the score for the episodes. Can you imagine if that was just the theme tune now? Gloria, Gloria. Do you know what? Fine, it's a change. Goes on and on and on. Okay, get out. <laughs> get out. It's an excellent movie by Jordan Peele, and you should definitely watch it. It is. We have. And you should. Many times. Um, but 
one thing that we've also watched many times, and inspired by the fact that Doctor Who is starting as of the release of this podcast in two days' time. Yes. The brand new series with uh, Chris Chibnall at the helm as showrunner, brand new writers, new composer, new effects work with different teams, uh, and of course, brand new main cast, um, including Jodie Whittaker as the Doctor. What better way to celebrate the oh, new brilliant. than by doing what everyone else does when we celebrate the new and looking backwards <laughs> at the old stuff? But specifically... My little owls. Yes. The oldest. The We're, oldest stuff. We set ourselves a challenge. Well, I set, I set the challenge of we need to figure out a topic. And you went, classic Doctor Who. I was like, great. And then you went, top tens. And I went, oh shit. So you yeah. laid a giant gauntlet down yeah. for us to, to That's one way of putting muse it. on. <laughs> so as, as is such, we're going to do what we, we did. We, we've done for a couple of... We've done a few episodes in the past, over the past couple of years, where we've done like our top five or top ten or whatever. Uh, we did like one Marvel supervillains. Like we we sort of we tried to narrow monsters. down who the best Marvel MCU yeah. villain actually was at that point. Although I think now we'd agree that Thanos would just go at the front of the list. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Killmonger or King Sorry. Peter or whatever it was in the end. I don't know. I hmm uh, hmm. I don't know. <laughs> I think I think rematch Killmonger, episode coming twenty twenty. Killmonger and, and Vulture are still a bit more relatable than I am going to kill half the universe. Hey, he's not going to kill half the universe. He's going to save half the universe. That's true. When you put it like that. Yeah. By killing... It makes <laughs> sense. We didn't even kill them. It's random. It's completely it's fair. Random. It's compassionless. It's fair. Um, But will this top ten be fair? No. Eh? Probably not. No. Um, this is completely opinion. So if you're... Yeah, that's, that's a, that is a big point. So if you're going to listen to this and go, you're wrong, you're wrong. No, we're not. It's opinion. That's how it works. But by all means, do get in touch and say, actually, I think... Da, 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 yeah. da, da. We like discussion. Debate and discussion, all for. Bring it on. Don't just say, wrong, 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 <laughs> wrong, 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 you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, because that's our job. Bell ringers. <laughs> Sentient bell ringers. Sentient bell ringers. We um, ring sentient bells. Ah, that's an episode of Doctor Who. Um, oh, look at this! I found a bell with a face. Season eleven Ow! villain confirmed. Sentient bell ringers. Um, new CGI effect to the season nineteen Blu-ray box set, including new companion CGI sentient bell. It's what <laughs> Tom wanted all along. <laughs> you put it in Peter's box set, you bastards! <laughs> I missed out by one season. No! Season 20 coming soon, complete with CGI talking cabbage. Yeah. So, um, these are things. Replacing Tegan. Now, oh god. <laughs> oh god, but it has, it has all of Jan- Janet Fielding's dialogue yeah. and everything. Well, Peter Davison has to come in and dub over every time he says, Braveheart Tegan, he has to say, Braveheart cabbage. <laughs> <sighs> <sighs> Braveheart, cabbage. <laughs> oh God! Well, talk about setting the tone. Um, yeah, we are about to reveal to each other as well, and there's been a heated debate in our own brains as to what's correct. In reverse order, our top ten classic era Doctor Who serials. Doctor Who. Um, so from the original seasons as they've been officially dubbed all the originals are seasons now seasons. and the newer ones are series if we're in the US it's they're all seasons Doctor <laughs> Doctor number season number really season 19 season 19 box set in the US is the complete Peter Davison season 1 how how are they going to do um, like the beginning of Trout and the beginning of Colin then because they both are during other series guarantee you that no one has thought about that. Great. <laughs> well, when it comes to Hartnell then, I guess Hartnell Series 3, they just have to shove it's the compl- Planet into No, no, it'd three. be the complete Hartnell Season 3, mm-hmm. and then Season 4 would be the complete Patrick Trout in Season 1, and it'd just have a hangover. That's really stupid. Yes. That's really stupid. Yes. That's real stupid. I mean, for yes. our, our catch up thing, our, our big marathon thing on YouTube, Lucy and I are doing. We, we're making it so that the thumbnail, for example, like for series four, is Troughton, but Hartnell's in the thumbnail, and we'll obviously be opening with like you know, this is the last first Doctor story and stuff. So, 
What, you mean you're not going to talk about the smugglers? Well, we can't, aside from <laughs> reading a Wikipedia article. doesn't exist! <laughs> well, you could listen to the soundtrack with linking narration by Peter Purvis. No, not Peter Purvis. Uh, who played Ben? Probably not uh, him either. Michael Craze. What? Michael was Cray it? Cray. Was it? I, I can't know. remember. I've forgotten. But I'll tell you what I can remember. What? Doctor Who. And which ten episodes who? are my favourite. Who sort of... Who talks first? You talk first, I talk first? Um, I'd like you to go first, Squire. You'd like me to go first? Yeah, you would okay. be a freaking Force Awakens quote. Number ten on <laughs> my... This is what it is at the moment, but might change by the end of the podcast. <laughs> Once you've filled your Black list. server, you're probably going to change it all over again. Mm. You'll revisit stories you've not watched in years. Mm. Yeah, I did that, and one of them nearly ended up on this top ten, but it didn't quite get in. Um, the Pirate Planet. Nice! From um, From, from season time. 16. The only, the only season 16 story that I would elevate to my top ten, although I might talk about some later on. Um... <laughs> Written by Douglas Adams and just brilliant and bonkers. It is about a planet that materialises around other planets and strip mines them. Literally a pirate planet. And it's ruled by a pirate captain who treats it like a ship. And the people on the planet are just like, oh yeah, this is great. The skies go funny and then all of these gems appear. It's amazing. It's amazing. And then there's also the Mentiads, which are the only weak part of the, se- of the serial, is the Mentiad design. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. The, the concept, good. The design and execution, as with a lot of a lot of classic Who, good concept, poor design and execution. Um, but it's a great... It's the pirate planet. What do you want me to say? It's Tom... Hello. It's... it's uh, what's his name? Bruce... Um, Bruce Cyborg Pirateman. Bruce Purchase is the captain. Bruce what? Um, Bruce Purchase. <sighs> Bruce. <laughs> no relation <laughs> to Ray. Bloody Purchase. You're the most homophobic space pilot in all of the galaxy. What is this? Gay for pirate pay. Toast. <laughs> well, well, well. Mr. Um, Fibuli! Uh, <laughs> I... I, you know, you introduced me to that one. I think the first time I watched that was with you. Because it's... In London. The great thing about the Pirate Planet... London! London! Um, the great thing about the Pirate Planet is that it veers from... As, in the way that Douglas Adams is so good at... I mean, just have a look at uh, Hitchhikers. It veers from, like, irreverence... Not too closely, they might not have watched. Well, hey! Um, <laughs> it veers from irreverence to, like, cutting social commentary in the same scene. Yes. Yeah. Um, the, of course, the, the one that we always reference because you like to mock me about it is the. Um, I'm not mock you so much as enjoy your delivery. It's, though. it's your delivery so it. good. It's the um, it's the scene where the Doctor's confronting the pirate captain and his gallery of of, of planets. His his, his bottled cities of Candor everywhere, yeah. all brainiac up in here. And always makes me think of Superman that concept. Just the idea yeah. that it's all contained. And I'm not going to do it now because I can't remember the full quote, and I'm just going to embarrass myself. But the outburst. <laughs> You're amongst friend. The outburst that Tom has when the pirate captain's gloating about his engineering genius that's come at the cost of billions and billions of lives and dozens of actual full planets. It's great. And then he's also got a rubber parrot on his shoulder. Of course, he does. like it's this. It's in the same. St- it's it's great. The fact that it can it can tow that line and not be completely ridiculous. Um, yeah, it's really good fun. And also, how many other stories does you get to see the Doctor run dynamite out of the TARDIS? <laughs> well, yeah, of and course. and do the plunger. <laughs> it's great. But what's it for? What is it for? That's amazing, though, the, the idea Appreciate that... Appreciate it. The, yeah, the entire time, like, sort of the part... You can see that he... Appreciation's the wrong word, but he, he get he, Like, he's he's in awe of what he's achieved. Mm. But he makes it very clear that what it is is horrific. Thinks it's absolutely reprehensible, yeah. It's so good. It's, it's the Doctor... It's the Doctor's... The, those, those, it's fun when stories like that happen, where the villain is of a certain intellect or... or, or Drive, but a complete moral crossroads with the doctor. Yeah, so like, it's like they all in another life, these two would completely respect one another, and as it stands, they're like, no, nope! like yeah. opposite ends of the ideological spectrum. 
Pirate Planet. Good show. I wasn't. I'll be honest. I wasn't expecting a story from Key to Time. Uh, it's not that all of those stories are bad. No, no, no. It's just the stuff to love. Stones of Blood is b- both parts m- naff and really enjoyable. Most oh, Stones of Blood could have made it. In. Oh man, it's so. <laughs> you need, this is how hard it is. Yeah. But and yeah, I'm sure we'll mention uh, at least one of those stories as we go on, um, even if it's not in the top ten. Anyway, give me your numero dis. So my number ten. Um, is definitely an example of uh, our top ten being stories that we enjoy or hold dear, not necessarily stories that are good. Good. My number ten is in my top ten because it was my first contact with Doctor Who. It is a wonderfully timed, in terms of how long it is, bite-sized chunk if you ever just want to put one on but don't have time for a full serial. It Good. shows a glimmer of something that could have been wonderful and in another medium got to be wonderful. I know where we're going with this. And also, it dresses for the occasion. Ah! Ah! My number 10 is the 1996 TV movie starring Paul Mejar. <laughs> Doctor Who. He's Dente. back. And it's about, it's about time. time. Um, love that. I saw a Dimmy the other day. She was putting on Twitter people complaining about the "It's about time" tagline on the new stuff. So, yeah. like, oh, it's just rubbing it in, like being a bit thingy. And she went, "Yeah, because they've never used that before, have never. they? They've, they've never, never used, used that. It. They've never used." And then she just posted the link to the TV movie trailer. Very good. Um, very good. And also, it is about time. It is literally about time. That's the title of the Six Shot NATO movie. It's think, about time. Think alarm clocks. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, Phoenix's Five Who Fans, Five Who Fans videos have pleasantly tainted yeah. that moment for me because now I just wanted to say, "Remember, Phoenix, remember the brilliant br- 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 atomic clock." <laughs> so the TV um, movie, it's... for those who don't know, happened in the wilderness years. It was seven years after the show was cancelled, it was... and it was essentially meant to be a backdoor pilot. Yeah, for it an, was a backdoor pilot for an NBC slash Universal slash possibly Fox backed television series. Yeah. Um, Featuring Paul McGann as a brand new Doctor uh, that was going to have at least eight episodes of a full series if it went to series order, each of which yeah. was a soft reboot no, slash was, remake of classic stories. There was there was a show bible floating about before mm. this got made, which would have been, uh, which would have remade some stories in a new continuity. Mm. Like Tomb but, of the Cybermen was yeah. one. But after that, that's where you got things like the Cybes. Oh, the, Christ, like the, yeah. the, the the cyberpunk Cyberman, um, but that and was the, and the Daleks with spider legs instead of. Um... I mean, that might have stuck around, but that was thrown out. That show Bible and that Reason. idea was thrown out before this was produced. Mm. But um, that was the what original. That was part of the original pitch that led to this. Yeah, part of that. I mean, obviously there were specific individuals who were part of this coming into existence. But what also fascinates me is that Spielberg was part of that decision along the way. Yeah, Amblin Entertainment had a hand in this. Because he, he he was and is, based on interviews as recently as about six years ago, a Doctor Who fan. And obviously must have thought, oh wow, yeah, if our company can help with that, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, which is really, really cool. But it's a shame because when you say all that, like Doctor Who was brought back on American television, a big event one night... And, and and it was a TV movie and it was going to be a launch of a brand new series and everything. You hear that and you go, yay! And then you watch it and you go, oh, but I really enjoy it. <laughs> I really, really hey, enjoy it. I cannot, <laughs> I I cannot disagree with you. It's such a small scale story for a Doctor Who, for, for an, ev- an event type story. Like I like, Do- I like when Doctor Who does smaller scale stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, like if every week is, oh, the universe is going to explode, I'm not interested anymore. Um, which is why I'm such a big fan of like the, the, the RTD era, because that only really sort of happens once or twice a series where it's like a, a galactic-wide threat, and, and usually was saved for the finale, so that the stakes in the finale felt big, and, and everything that preceded it felt more like one-off adventures. But the TV movie is a big event, yeah, and it is kind of small scale. Like, obviously there's, you know, there's a big universal co- um, consequence if the Master's plan and everything goes ahead, but... It's you know it's, it's ultimately the master wants a new body, and the doctor's <laughs> regenerated and doesn't know who he is, and that's the yeah. plot. Um, um it, yeah, it was <laughs> so it was Philip Siegel who was the producer who created the new show Bible, and that's all the stuff of the doctor and the master being half brothers and their f- missing father Ulysses, Ulysses who is Barossa's yeah. son, um, 
and the master becomes president and the doctor flees in the TARDIS and it's all about him trying to um, find, find Ulysses father, yeah. and Barusa is in the TARDIS like his, his spirit is emerged with the TARDIS right. so and um, that's also where him being half human comes from as well on my mother's um, side on, his, on my mother's side which I've never but, hated I know I, yeah that's and I know and I know it's essentially been if not abandoned definitely shoved under a thousand carpets um it's been it's been it's been buried in the basement of a carpet right basically yeah um but I don't hate that idea because it would explain his weird fondness for for our little rock for soul free yeah yeah, yeah. um the it, part of his DNA sense. is based in in earth so I do, I do like that idea, and I like the way McGann delivers that line because it is really such a brief moment, and you get that wonderful moment where Grace sort of, in response to it, sort of goes like, "Huh," and then it sort of has moved away from really quickly. Yeah, um, Daphne, Ash, Daphne Ashbrook, isn't Daphne it? Daphne Ashbrook. She's great in this. Um, proper like American melodrama in places. Really nicely yeah. subtle. Really nicely subtle, subtle and kind of British style approach to the humor from her it's, as well. At some points, it's the first time you've really got. An American, um, an American American doctor, an American thing. American doctor. Yeah, it's the first mm. time that, that very this very <laughs> British institution. Because before this, it's just Canadian actors barking orders at Cybermen, it's and like, they're not. Get out of our base, sir! We're gonna line the rockets and blow you all sky high. Correct me if I'm wrong. Oh, I. <laughs> but there aren't any stories set in contemporary America in the classics. Oh no! It's, there's a bit in the chase. There's a there? very brief scene in the chase at yeah. the top of the Empire State Building. But yeah. other than that, there's no <laughs> classic Who story set in I, then contemporary I believe, America. I believe you're correct, sir. Yeah, I don't. I don't think there is a single contemporary America set story in Doctor Who till the TV movie. Yeah, uh, and even after that, uh, not again until Dalek. Oh, Dalek! Wow. Dalek's set in America, but it doesn't really count because it's underground. Yeah, it's, you don't see any American culture in there. I think after that, it's uh, start series six when they get yeah. back to present day. When they're at present day at the beginning of the story. Yeah, that's about it, really. I think. Oh, and then yeah, because after that, it's all in the past and whatnot. I think it because um, you got they go uh, back to the past and stuff like Daleks in Manhattan and and the rest of Impossible Astronaut Day of the Moon and things like that. Angels take Manhattan is period. Angels take Manhattan is period. Yeah. Wow. Um, I think part of it's modern day. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, so so it's 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 weird to see it in that kind of setting. Um, his outfit is brilliant, and I love the fact that it is just a fancy dress outfit. Like they still yeah. give it a scene of he's putting the outfit together, but it's just because he finds it because there's a costume party for the for the for the Y two K countdown. Oh yeah, a costume it's, party. It's all about the millennium, people. the the millennium approaching. It was one of those sort of pre millennial. Oh, there's going to be some sort of apocalyptic event like, at the millennium, close maybe. That guy counting down, like what? No, yeah. that's why the camera is creepy. Uh, for comedy, modern co- like modern comedy fans, Will Sasso's in there playing the guy in the uh, the the mortuary, the guy watching Bride of Frankenstein, Frankenstein on the TV. It's a lie. Uh, lemons. <laughs> that's what most people online will know him from for those vines he did when he freaking destroyed Vine by being brilliant. Um, fantastic comedy actor, but like weird that Vine is his legacy. But anyway. um, so yeah, that's amazing. And I mean, let's talk about Eric Roberts. I mean, what ha- what. What more could be said about the the <laughs> glorious talent Cause here's that is thing. Eric Roberts? We presume, based on what we see of Gordon Tipple's silhouette at the beginning, when he's on trial with the Daleks, we swear, Your Honour. The behind-the-scenes um, stuff, he looks like the Jonathan Price master from Curse of Fatal Death. Yeah. But again, like it looks like they've gone with the Ainley thing, because, you know, Ainley... He's got the beard, yeah. Ainley wasn't a Time Lord body. Um, he was the bloody King of Tracken, wasn't it? And that's uh, his body. King of Tracken, yeah, something like that. Yeah, it was Nissa's dad, wasn't it? Uh, which they never really touch on in the show, which always annoyed me. Because Framus. Like, you could get so much more drama out of this, but think, you're not doing it. I think they do at the stat... I think they do in Logopolis, mm. but... It's like, he's wearing your dad's face. After that, after <laughs> the... After they... They sort of address it in, Legop- in Legopolis. It never comes up again. And it's, like, it's, it's, like it's like Andrew's death. Oh, he died. He wouldn't want us to mourn. No, Let's go and have us. a wacky adventure with Concord. Um, so, like, but but uh, for me, that that implies that essentially that personality, like the only personality, that is the personality Eric Roberts is playing. And when you think of it that way, it sort of works. It's very jarring if you've just watched Survival because the personality is much different. Yeah. But if you're thinking of it as like you know time flight. Ainley, 
<laughs> like I'm gonna disguise myself for no reason. Yeah, that's what Roberts is doing. Like he's yeah. just being camp and all this, just like camp uh, as Christmas. It's just it's although it's more close to New Year. He's so. both dreadful yet perfect for it. Yes, because he is threatening. He's as camp as the material allows him to be, and then pushes it a bit further. Yes. The Terminator look really does work for the first half of the story. Yeah. The fact that he's the body's decaying is a really interesting idea, which the Master is obviously like, that's been part of a lot of his stories. And they don't like, really do much with it. Apart from the creepy fingernail bit. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, it's, I enjoy that. And I really like McCoy in it. Yeah. McCoy in that TARDIS interior at the beginning him just oh. sat there listening to freaking smooth jazz while eating jelly babies out of a little tray and then having a cup of tea while reading the time machine by hg wells it's just like this is adorable it's so doctor and, and the who. seventh doctor's tweet look is really nice yeah like he's clearly Implying, been around for yeah, this a doctor while. has now has now lived for quite some time which is great i love it when the doctor's noticeably of age because you yeah. go oh they've lived for longer which considering how slowly time lords must age he must have been the seventh doctor for quite a while. Yes. Um, Which I like. There's only a few doctors that sort of come across like that. The, the fourth doctor, definitely, because yeah. his look and vibe changes. Um, the sixth doctor, definitely, because between Colin's like first full series and, and trial, like he looks really different. And there is an indeterminate amount of time between then because. Well, they fuck because about the adventures have gone with, on and with Perry. And with Mel and, and stuff yeah. played around with. Obviously, Big Finish can expand on things like so even that. Though, if, you, if you welcome Big Finish I mean, into your canon, then more stuff This is happened. where Trial falls apart. Yeah. Because if he's brought into the Trial during what <laughs> ends up being his last adventure with Perry, then when did he meet Mel? And how can he have... Well, isn't the implication of the thing with Mel that yeah. he's not met her yet and here's the evidence of what you're about to do. I think there's at least one big finish that deals with the implication of Mel ha- starting travelling with the Doctor before she's actually started travelling with the Doctor. <laughs> Christ. Because she leaves with him at the end of trial but uh, but he hasn't met her yet. Dirty! Um, the Tenth Doctor has aged a tiny bit but it's more about how they just refine his hair and style so that yeah, he looks a little yeah, yeah. older. Um, Eleven and Twelve uh, well, we know Eleven lives a long while. Yeah, but eleven and twelve definitely. I think. I think in the history of yeah, in the canon of the show, the eleventh Doctor had the longest life. I believe. Yeah, because he's on Christmas for God knows how long. Yeah, um, but even before that, like, there's a gap between series five and him meeting with them in series six. And oh stuff yeah, of course, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and stuff like that. Uh, the War Doctor obviously apparently ages quite rapidly, which makes the Doctor post the War Doctor even older than he's claiming to be. Well, also like the War Doctor probably aged rapidly because the Time War. True, but also, I mean, we like, get into a whole other thing. We'll talk about this another time, I guess. Yes, let's not, about, let's but like, not, but like, you know, the seventh Doctor this. claims to be nine hundred years old. The ninth Doctor claims to be nine hundred years old. I always just took that more as a because we didn't know it was the, the War Doctor at that point. Yeah, I always took that more as a he was ashamed of what happened during the Time War, so that he's almost like he's re- to himself. He's just decided to reset. Well, also, they hadn't written the War Doctor at that mm. point. <laughs> So Moffat hadn't come in with his monkey wrench and gone, oh! <laughs> no, but do you know, do you know what I mean? What's it, this? It's more, more like whatever he did as the Eighth Doctor involved in those events and what he was ashamed of, it's like he's yeah. hit a reset clock. And then it implies that the Ninth Doctor does live for, like, about a year. Yeah. Which I like, because, like, that's fine. That suits his story perfectly. Um, he comes... Because Tennant ages season by season. Yeah. Um, and then Smith ages massively. But anyway, I, I like McCoy's look in this, and, and it's... It's not great. It isn't. But I, I have so. It much does fun have a certain it. campy charm to it. Though, I have so it? much fun watching it, and that middle eight. Oh yeah. It's so good. It's not and, though, is it? Oh, it is. I mean, I mean, nostalgia is a powerful thing. I could. You can. It is probably the worst arrangement of the theme tune. Get out. It, prob- it is, though, isn't it? Get out of this part of the conversation and bring <laughs> us your number nine. Number nine. Um, we need to be quicker. This is going to be a 400-hour podcast. Oh, God. Rate. Okay. I started um, talking about the TV movie. So let's sorry. talk at double speed. Uh, number nine is... <laughs> um, it's a Dalek story. 
Oh, it's probably not the one that you think it is. Ah, it is. Ah, Waters the... of Mars it doesn't really count. They only appear in a flashback, Matt. So, Remembrance of the Daleks from season twenty-five. Um, noish, noish. Uh, I love it. Yes, it's it's very good. Slight spoilers. It is the only Dalek story in my top ten. Wow. Um, okay. I, I'm starting to wonder if I have any in mine. And. 10. I have one in my top ten. Spoiler alert. And it might not be the one... And, and of course, as I'm saying, it, everyone would probably pick Genesis because everyone loves Genesis. I do love Genesis. I Genesis, do love Genesis is a great story. But Remembrance is... It's at that point, and this is why I like a lot of season 25 and season 26, it's that point where the show begins to morph into what it would become when it's revived. Yeah, like it, it, and... it starts to shift from... Colin's ear is very much the same as Peter's in terms yeah. of the tone of the show uh, and, and almost suffers because they double down on that tone and they double down on that tone in McCoy's first series and it's really jarring yeah. and does not work for the most part. And then in his second series they go, well, hang on. What if we did it a bit more like this? Yeah. And by his last series, that is the tone. Yeah. And it's, and it's so good. Unfortunately, and, it, and, it's ve- t- and it's very modern. It's It's very sort of... Um, current day science fiction. Uh, like it, it decided to do what Next Generation had done in the States. Yeah. And let's do it like now. Let's do it but how un- we do it now. But unfortunately, mm. it was too little too late because yeah. it was going up against stuff like the Next, Next Generation, Generation yeah. which in terms of budget, production value and all that stuff, just blew it out the fucking water. Yeah. It's like you look at this show, even with all the work the Restoration team have done on it, and you're like, you look at stuff like moments like the, um, the, 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 Dalek ship landed in the sc- in the school in the school playground, mm. and it it looks like mid nineties kids TV. Yes, it looks like Aquila. Yeah, and it's and it's like oh this <laughs> this should take be a better. shot if you remember Aquila. And then you look at an episode <laughs> of the Next Generation at the same time, and you're going, oh man, this looks great still. Next and, Generation, and gorgeous. It, it just doesn't. It just didn't have the oomph in the production value to to. To hang tough, but the the quality of the writing was so far above what had come before, even the previous season. Mm. Oh, this, was, this was Ben Aranovich's first story. <laughs> definitely for the previous season. And like, can it just? Who am I? And who are you? And it's the first. And then they decided to really start playing with the mythology of the show. Yes. Um. And and well, the seeds get mystery. to be the seeds get yeah. to be sown here that that only then unfortunately grew during the Virgin New Adventures era. Really. Yeah. Um. The Carmel, Carmel Master, Master Plan, Plan. Yeah. begins here, and it just that extra bit of depth really helps it breathe. and And then you've got stuff like the the um, ripples conversation that he has in the cafe. God, and... I can't remember the actor's name, but Jeffrey from Fresh Prince. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a really, really good scene. I think I retweeted this scene the other day. Yeah, because doing the rounds because because someone tweeted it. Uh, Demi might have tweeted. Yeah, it, actually. yeah. She, uh, she 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 loves Seven. Yeah, Tom, and Seven it with like saying like, oh, and people say Sylvester McCoy can't act. Yeah, and it's like, no, this is a great scene. It's phenomenal. Um, and I mean, it gives us so many moments. Yeah, baseball bat to a Dalek's face. The, oh man, the baseball bat. Um, like, you know, unlimited just, rice pudding, etc., etc. Um, which just shows the balls on Ace that she's just like she's confronted with the Dalek. Yeah. She doesn't really know what it is, like in terms of what how much of a threat it is. Yeah, and she just starts wailing on its eye stalk with a baseball bat. It's brilliant. Like that is one of the ballsiest things a companion in Doctor Who has ever done. Yeah, whether it was foolish or you know or, or brave, doesn't matter. It's cool as fuck. There's the lovely callbacks to the uh, to Unearthly Child. child. Yeah. It, take, it takes place like a couple of days after an Unearthly Child, doesn't it? Yeah, because like, it's set in the 60s, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah is, there a, is there a direct nod to Ian and Barbara? I can't remember. Um, yes. Someone mentioned that they've not because shown up to class the or science, The science lab yeah. is Ian's science lab because the book on the French Revolution is still on the desk. Oh, God. Because Ace yeah. picks it up and starts yeah. leaping through it. Damn, that's awesome. And um, See, that's how you do continuity yeah. stuff. You don't keep doing it. Just every now and again, every blue moon, you reference something like that from something way back when, and it's not a big thing. And it's things like, like that it, that the, mean that... The modern era just screws that up a lot. But yeah, it's like, yeah. like like in Time of the Doctor, a good example, when he's, the puppet show's going on, one of the puppets is just a monoid. 
that's how you do yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how you do it. It's just like, oh shit! Like he's told them the story of of um, freaking the Ark. Like, oh, that's he's really told cool. them all the stories. Like that's that's um, that's how you do it. Oh god, that's really you... nice. There's things like that that mean that make me think that this should have been the 25th anniversary story instead of oh, Silver agreed, Nemesis. Agreed. Especially because Silver Nemesis steals so much of its structure from this. Yeah, Silver Nemesis but, is like a shit remake of yeah, Remembrance of the Daleks. It's, contra- it's um, condensed into three episodes and they add this ridiculous plot line about someone travelling back from the future. Yeah. Travelling back from the past in, to meet up neo-Nazis with a magical bow and arrow and statue. I shit you not... Um, Remembrance again is a simple story. There are high stakes, yeah, but it's simple and straightforward. It, yeah, um, it's got a really cool reveal because Davros had shown up in Genesis, and then they, uh, not Terry Nation, but the show had decided, obviously, then after that, that Davros had to be a key player. Yeah. So whenever there was a Dalek story, there's three, three more after, four more after Genesis. Yeah. Whenever there was a Dalek story, Davros had to be in it. Yeah. And that was both exciting because his character was interesting, but then again, kind of made them formulaic. Those stories became but it, formulaic. But a it bit, did a also bit introduce an ongoing plot thread within the Dalek stories. That of, was the that which, yeah. which which finally pays off in Remembrance. Yeah, um, and Davros is saved. He's the cliffhanger of Episode Three, isn't he? Like he's it's revealed like yeah, oh shit, so. Davros is the is they, the Dalek they, Supreme, they the Dalek Emperor. Him because you think it's the Dalek battle computer looks yeah. like Davros, but you only see it from behind. Yeah, and then it's later on it's revealed that it's the little girl inside yeah. the chair. Yeah, um, and which is great as well. That whole stuff, yeah, really good. Um, so it's it, yeah, and then when the Emperor dome flips up and it's Davros inside there. Yeah, or Davros's head at least. Yeah, whatever. well, yeah. Because we don't really know after the last well, time. Well, he's had his other arm, he had his other hand blown off. Blown off, off in... Uh, in in uh, Revelation. Which, again, that, again, that's how you do subtle continuity. When he then comes back again in the Tenth Doctor's era, he's got, the metal, he's got a metallic yeah. hand. And they don't speak on it, it's just there and you're like, of course, of course he's had to build himself yeah. a new hand. They got it shot off in Revelation. Yeah. Um, it's very good. It's, Remembrance is very good. I the, like it a the lot. The stair cliffhanger. The stair cliffhanger, um, the whole subplot with Mike and him being a, a, a fascist. Yeah. Um, That's some... And the, the subtle racism stuff. stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's 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 a really good story. It's the, it's the first time the show sort of showed what it could be if you let modern people... If you let then modern writers yeah. take a good crack at it. And, and, and go... Yeah, we we grew up with it and we loved it. Yeah, but we don't want to do the same stuff we grew up with. We want to do new things with it. Yeah, and that that definitely led to it, survival's the most obvious mm. because that does almost feel like a new series. Aside episode. from maybe like the cat costumes, survival has yeah. aged really well. Yeah, like um, really well. So yeah, this is the beginning of that shift. Yeah. Right. What's your number nine, Cocker? My number nine, if I choose to accept it. Um, it is a story with a repetitive tune. It gets on your tits at the last chance saloon. The gunfighters, the William Hartley story. I've not seen the gunfighters. The gunfighters. Tell me about the gunfighters. So much fun. Okay, so it's from uh, the final stretch, really, of Hartley. It's from toward the end of series three. Yeah. Yeah, the companions are Stephen and Dodo. Is it his last? I, th- I think it's the, the only full Dodo being a full yeah, part yeah. of its story you can watch. I was going to say it was was it his, his last fully complete story, but no, that's the War Machines. Uh, War Machines, yeah, because the last fully complete. Um, which Dodo Dodo's in it, but she buggers off. She yeah, gets, yeah, She gets hypnotised, she gets woken up sort of, she goes to have a lie down at a country home and never returns. That's it, she's like, oh, I'm done, I'm um, done. But yeah, no, this is great. And, and the thing is, it makes me realise that the stories that are missing from around then, I would love to see, because the three of them play off each other really well. Yeah. Um, so the gunfighters is, is, is a phenomenal bit of work because it's, it's a pure historical, which I love already, but now that I've been marathoning it with Lucy, like that's her favorite kind. And I, I had to like sort of, sort of regretfully inform her that she was about like, as she was watching it, she was watching the last pure historical she was going to see. Yeah. Um, uh, sorry about that. She was like, Oh, so there's no more like this. I went, well, yeah. And, uh, Black, Black, Black Orchid yeah. in about eight months time of our marathon yeah, yeah. Like, so we it'll be sometime next one. year um but yeah it, it's it, it's the events leading up to the gunfight at the okay corral yeah 
Yeah. And it features all the characters involved in that. It features Wyatt Earp, and it features uh, Doc Holliday primarily, and the Clantons, yeah. And, and um, uh, oh God, what's his name? Johnny Ringo. Yeah. And it it's just, it's a perfect little, like, tale of, 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 of of misleading identity and like you know that mob mentality stuff all the classic yeah. kind of cowboy stuff that at that point was very popular in cinema yeah because it was around the same time that westerns were really getting big yeah imagine doing like a western like that on a bbc tv budget yeah the early 60s was when the western was really beginning to take off in america and in the cinemas and and for doctor who to attempt it it looks great as well like it looks great, mm. and it, it's like the, the stakes are there because like the the threat is a bullet. The, the threat, threat is, is a, real. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's not. You know, just imagine destruction on a universe wide scale. No, we as human beings can imagine that. Yeah, but we can very easily imagine someone being shot by a gun and killed. Yeah, that's a lot like, closer at home, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, and and that is the threat in this episode of people are going to be killed for for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. But it also starts in the most charming way imaginable. The previous story, which is Celestial Toymaker, um, ends with him with a toothache. So he just basically like sets controls to land anywhere, hoping that he'll find a dentist. <laughs> so when they come out at the beginning, they they come out in a barn, and, and Dodo and Stephen sort of realise what period of history they're in. Mm-hmm. So they go back into the Doctor's wardrobe while he's trying to figure out what to do next, and they just they. But they just come out in cowboy outfits, cowboy and, up. and it's 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 the Mighty McFly Back to the Future three styles, so like really garish. Yeah, but they're loving it, and then they encounter actual people, and they keep commenting on how stupid they look yeah. or how brightly dressed they are. I think I need to see the gunfires. It's really fun. Yeah. It's, it's a four part. The only downside is it has this continuous narration thing, which is a song. Yeah, I've heard the, tone the song. The, it says the yeah. tone at the very beginning, and then it doesn't fuck off because the song's on the. Um, 50th anniversary album. Yeah. So I've heard the song, yeah. but not in context. It is annoying as sin. Um, but it's great. Great villains. Uh, everybody's going for it. And there are two. <laughs> Johnny Ringo is sort of like our biggest threat when he enters the story. His accent wavers a bit, but it's not yeah. terrible because his conviction's really good. Yeah, yeah. And that you can sort of get around having a dodgy but it's accent. All British actors playing Americans. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, you good. can sort of get around having good. a dodgy accent in theatre and some TV stuff if your delivery and your conviction is so good. Yeah. You can sort of ignore it a bit. Um, but then there's one of the Cantons who... It's Cantons, isn't it? Clanton. Clanton, that's it. Ike Clanton and some other guy. One of them who sort of looks like uh, Budget Jim Dale. Uh, Budget Which is... Oh, seriously, when you look at this Brilliant. guy, look at Jim Dale and Carol Cowboy specifically. Brilliant. You know, this is the same guy. Um, Brilliant. Budget Jim Dale can't do the accent for shit and he has so many lines. Good. So you get a Good. bunch of accidental joy from this story. It's the only Doctor Who story with an attempted lynching as well so enjoy that everyone oh good 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 um, yeah uh, right what's your number 8 Squire um, my number 8 is uh, the oft uh, mocked but very close place to my heart uh, John Pertwee ecological morality tale The Green Death okay again one of right. my again similar to your TV movie one of my yeah. very earliest Doctor Who experiences was a BBC2 repeat of this um, what's not to love? Giant maggots. Giant maggots. Green slime. Lots of Welsh accents. That scene um, at the end. That scene at the end. Which is freaking heartbreaking when Joe leaves. Yeah. And, the, he, and um, he sort of is just like, you can tell that he cares a lot more for her than maybe he'd been letting on. Like, he obviously yeah. he obviously cared for Joe, but like, you know, you, you see that he's, I think this is the first time since Hartnell where a companion's left, you can see that he's hurt. Yeah. Like, this is the first time since Ian and Barbara leaving where you can see that he's really upset that they've gone. Yeah. It's because like, they were oh. they were very close. They were very close. And that that the the, the Cliff <laughs> Professor Cliff Jones Jones yeah. is Jones, isn't it? It is Jones. Yeah. It is Jones because uh she becomes they've Jones. definitely married and in Sarah Jane uh, Adventures Death of the Doctor there's a whole thing about the fact they are Smith and Jones, yeah. continuing Russell's Affinity for he Smith and Jones as surnames. He loves it. He does. Um, he does. So <laughs> Which yeah, means um, that her, her, her grandson is Santiago Jones. Santiago <laughs> Jones. <laughs> He's also the Iron Fist. Um, <laughs> so yeah, just is. I mean, this. I, it's a shame because it's one of her. Um, it's her last story, but mm-hmm. it's also one of her best. Yeah, because it, which I suppose is you know a good way to go. It's be- best to yeah. go out on a high than to not. But you do get yeah. a bit of the ah ah, I'm in a terrible situation. 
situation and come and see him. But you also get a lot of her being proactive and mm. um, investigative and com- combative, particularly when she first meets the professor. Um, that whole scene with them bickering uh, at the Nuttuch. Yeah. It's just <laughs> great. I've not watched this one in so long. It's and I want to ve- watch it's, it now. It's six episodes, so it's, you know, it's a longer one, but it's just great fun. <laughs> and, you know, giant maggots and an insane computer. What more do you want? A milkshake? All right. Oh, and the doctor in, <laughs> the doctor in disguise is a cleaning lady. Yes! Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> and also doing his Welsh milkman impression. It's one of the it's one of the great showcases of Pertwee's where he's sort of like bringing some of his comedy into yeah, the role because he, um, he didn't get to show off his comedy a lot in Doctor. But Who. when he did, like when, in this yeah. one, very good, very good, John. God, he was funny. He was funny. And that's that story again. Yeah, is is brill. And also, if you hate insects, you'll probably shit yourself. <laughs> yes. If you hate gross things, you'll shit. If yourself. If you don't like maggots, it's not for you. What's your number eight, Cocker? My number eight is, uh, and I have a suspicion you've got this one too. <laughs> Um, my number eight is probably the best last story for a doctor, and it's the Caves of Androzani. This is also in my top ten. It is. We might, all right, we might save it then for. Do you want to save it when we do it's yours? Coming? But but um, reasons why it's in my top ten, pure and simple. Uh, it's it's a fantastic, and a lot of people always go on about this, but I, I it needs to be gone on about because it's a fantastic reason for the story to be as it is, and for the script to take the choices it does. It's a brilliant showcase of how selfless the Doctor is, ultimately. Yeah, yeah. That he is willing to save the life of a complete stranger he's known for about a day over himself. Well, it depends on how many big finishes you've listened to. Yeah. (laughs) Well, that's the thing. Doing that almost removes how effective it is. Yeah, yeah. Because, like, as far as you're concerned when you're watching the episodes, watch Planet of Fire and and then Caves of Androzani, he's known Perry for, like, maybe two days. Yeah. And he will do anything to make sure she is safe because he knows that she's only there because of him. And he's like, he will protect her. He will look after her. Um, and again, just the, the you know, you're not going to stop me now moment. It's like, that's when suddenly the fifth Doctor, who is my, who's probably my second least favourite Doctor, not because I don't like him. I like him all in some way, but he's he's the one who I connect with. I don't like a lot of his stories. As less. That's why. I'm, yeah. not too, I'm not too big on that TARDIS team. Apologies to anybody who really loves that TARDIS team, but like, uh, you know the 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 four lot for the majority of his run and everything. Yeah. Like it's, they're not they're not my fave. I can watch them. But they're not my fave. The fifth Doctor I don't really connect with as much because he is sort of more um, vanilla, and that's not a shit on Davison's performance. Oh, just vanilla the, for that. Matter. He's not as he's not as eccentric as his predecessor, which is very jarring. Now that I'm doing the whole thing in a marathon, maybe when I get to the fifth Doctor, I'll feel it differently because it'll be the first time I'm doing it in context. You will feel it differently, but. In that story, I'm like, yeah, that's that is the Doctor, and that is possibly the bravest he has ever been. Yeah, and it's really cool to watch, and it's a great regeneration scene at the end. But we'll get um, we'll get back to it later. Feels different this time. Die, um, Doctor, die. My number seven, then uh, another Pertwee one, Ooh. and another eco. I've, I've got a feeling he might pop up most in these. But go on, uh, another ecological uh, tale, an ecological moral tale, and also you know a bit of. Good old anti-fascism and the that old favourite, the parallel universe. It is, <gasps> of course, oh, in Inferno. Inferno. Um, nice, it's nice, the, nice, nice. It's the longest story it's on my seven, um, seven episodes. Yeah. It's season seven, everything about from spared with seven parts to save money. Yeah. Um, it's the longest story on my uh, top ten. And I fucking adore it because it's so dark. Yeah. It and it, it is that one of the fun things about doing parallel universe stories in sci fi is that you get to see not only do you get to see um familiar characters acting in, in strange ways, but you also get, if you need to go that far, to just completely fucking destroy a universe. Yeah. And it's, that, and it's when you can have your cake and eat it of like killing off familiar characters in ways that really are gut punches, but then still being able to go back and, and play with stuff, which for a show about time travel, Doctor Who doesn't do that often. Yeah, it's very rare. It, may, it makes a point of it being. Yeah, rare. they don't do they don't do the whole oh something went bad in the future. With these, we saw something go bad in the future with these characters. Let's go back and make sure it doesn't happen. Doesn't really happen in this show because they yeah. they do talk about cause and effect a lot. And once something's happened, I should change it. Change not it. one line. Yeah, it's a fixed point in time. 
You can't change it. But also the parallel um, universe thing, like the, the the show's made a point of that being. They don't really it's do that wrong. Much. Yeah, like yeah. You sh- this shouldn't be happening. Uh, again, reference to maybe our younger view, younger listeners, like the modern era. Um, uh, oh God, Age of uh, Rise of the Side Man, Age of yeah, Steel. Yeah. In that, the whole point is to get there. It's like it's parallel universe. We shouldn't be here. Yeah. And the plan was to just stay by the TARDIS until it's ready to leave. Yeah. Like even in that story, it's like no at first and it's like okay alright they haven't done Parallel Universe since have they since that <clears> season no closest has been uh, uh, oh no probably, probably had a pocket timeline a, a pocket universe sort of like sort of not alternate reality per se but sort of removed from reality in the Doctor's wife yeah and uh, the Monk trilogy sort of perverts, oh, yeah, perverts yeah. the timeline a bit in a way where it's then reset and changed oh um turn left plays with plays yeah because it. It, it, it doesn't well, it does sort of happen, happen, but it's like yeah. everything's in shift, everything's in flux. Yeah, yeah. And that's and how then, Rose is able to get, yeah, like, Rose... find Donna, because it's like, something was going on there, and we found you. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, yeah, yeah you're right. Turn, which is why Turn Left is such a treat, because it was, oh, such, a one, it was such a one-off. Yeah. Um, but Inferno is, is a whole, um, like, two-plus-hour serial, two-plus-hour story mm. about that. And also, what a great doctor to do that. Because, you know, it's a story of freaking, like, nuclear annihilation and... It's not even that. It's and, and, and the sort of the dark espionage elements. It's, it's like, well, let's throw our James Bond doctor into the scenario. It's part of that ecological does. bent that was all over the, yeah. the, the Barry Letts era and, and, and Pertwee stuff in particular. Well, that and first like, series, like, post, yeah. post Spear. I mean, Spearhead's got tones of it but it's not part of the story yeah but Silurians well then Silurians definitely and Ambassadors of Death's got a bit of it I've well. not seen Ambassadors all the way I through so. I wouldn't recommend rushing to Ambassadors um, of Death um, it's but, one of those long ones where it's long and you're like I wish this wasn't long yeah Inferno flies by because it's mm. just this, there's edgy, something edgy, happening edgy, edgy all the action. time and it's a constant countdown because mm. it's all about drilling to the Earth's core and that releasing some uh, ridiculous power that can destructive power and some ridiculous destructive power ridiculous destructive power <laughs> and of course in the, in the parallel universe you get to see that happen yeah the race is kind of to get back to the parallel universe which is slightly ahead of ours because everyone's a fascist <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and they don't have health and safety and um can you get back to ours in time to stop it and that's so that sort of constant momentum keeps it moving along at a nice real tick i, lo- I, I love inferno i love it it's great Good shout. Very good shout, sir. Very good. Very good. Uh, What's yours? Seven, isn't it? Uh, my number seven, should I choose to accept it? Yes. Yes. It's only... Oh, God. It's the next story. Uh, Terror of the Autons is my number yeah. seven. Yeah. Start of John's second series. The Fucking beginning love Autons. The beginning of that beautiful series of... Oh, this year... Yeah, this year is going to have the same villain. It's just in every story, either in charge of what's happening or taking advantage of what's happening. Uh, you like the Doctor? We're going to give you an arch villain for him specifically. It introduces Delgado as the master. Yeah, yeah. It, in it reintroduces, wonderful fashion. It reintroduces my favorite Doctor Who monster. Yeah. In appearance number two of technically only three where they're the villain of a story. It's very good. It's um, very, very good. And it's got a generation of kids for reasons. Obvious reasons. Yeah. And it's the introduction of Joe Grant. Yes. Who is bloody wonderful in this because so after, 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 after the sh- And last story in the top tens. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, ju- ju- judging by... Congrats, Katie Manning. You yeah. are officially, so far, the dominant companion of this countdown. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, like... What's wonderful about Joe and her introduction is like we've had Liz Shaw for the first series. And I always feel like Liz Shaw is shafted, but you know she's great in that in that first series, series seven, isn't it? Yeah. First year. So in series eight, new companion, and we go from an incredibly sort of intelligent, on it, capable woman who could sort of rival the Doctor for smarts, yeah, to somebody who's nowhere near that, but is is as endearing as all hell and just wants to help, yeah. And it's it's wonderful across that series, but also the the seed is sown in that story to see him sort of be like, "Are you fucking kidding?" Yeah, like this is Are my lab assistant. For real? Are you kidding? But over the course of it, begins to realize he's being an asshole. Like she is a good person. Yeah, he just needs to sort of take her under his wing a bit more. Come under my wing, Joe. It's very come under my wing, Joe. I have several on these kids. Uh, Joe, come under my wing. So many cakes. And, and it begins a really nice relationship between those two, yeah. where. He becomes the um, for series one is the action man like James Bond figure. Yeah. In his second series, he starts to go back toward uh, a bit of a shift. Like because 
He's a bit more avuncular. Yeah, Troughton, like, obviously Hartnell was very grandfatherly to the younger char- characters. Yeah. Troughton sort of continues to be grandfatherly, maybe slightly more quirky uncle. Yeah. Pertwee's not like that at first. And now he starts to slip back into his more paternal instincts. Yeah. In a de- to a degree, I mean, by the end of it, him and Joe are very much. He sort of sees them both definitely as equals. Yeah, but he he helps her sort of become a, a, a not a better person because she's already brilliant, a lovely person. But like he he helps her become a better version of herself. Over yeah, of course, their yeah, stories yeah, yeah. and inspires inspires her in that way. Be the best Joe Grant you can be. Yeah, and her and her sort of attitude mellows him out over time as well he becomes less pissed off that he's stuck there yeah yeah to the point absolutely. where like once he can travel a bit no brainer like joe's coming with me yeah like do you know what i mean yeah, like, yeah. It, it's like yay come on joe so come on joe so their relationship's really fun delgado's master introduction and pertwee's interaction with him the first i mean the first time the first scene where he's basically snuck into unit and you have the whole, like, how did you get it? And he says, oh, Doctor, don't be so trivial. And they just yeah. bat past a really big plot hole because the Master's like, that's not important. Yeah. I'm, um, I'm hyper-competent. It doesn't matter. It's so good. Um, the Master, again, brilliant villain. Yeah. The Autons get more creative. We get some, like, dummies in this, but we mostly get, like, mascots and dolls that come to life. Yeah, that weird troll doll and telephone cables <laughs> the longest telephone flex in the world the throttle people <laughs> they're not successfully because there's a hand in the way so it's, it's the daffodils that are terrifying the daffo- well they're, they're with the plastic film over yeah, people's faces yeah. but obviously the shot that freaking aroused the anger of uh of the mary white house yeah um the shot of the policeman of yes. the policeman's face being peeled away to reveal a blank plastic face underneath oh. That that so shit is good. so good, so good. And if you can take your cynical eye off and ignore that split second of of obvious thing underneath face for a moment, that shot is horrifying. Yeah, it is. Like it's really creepy. I love Terror of the Autons, and as well you should. It's brilliant to the point where the moment I got a bit of disposable income in 2010, I was like, I want this, but it's not on DVD yet. I think like a year later was when they finally released Mannequin yeah, yeah. Mania with with it in the box set. I was like, I really want Terror of the Autons. Got a bit of disposable income. Found it was on iTunes. It was the first thing I bought on iTunes. Yeah. I was just like, get in my iTunes. Now I want to watch it. I want you in my eye holes. I love Terror of the Autons. I, I first saw it on UK Gold years ago as a kid when that, yeah. those repeats I, began. Yeah, I saw it on the repeat. BBC did some repeats. They... they I, they, it was, I it was sort of around plan. the time of the TV movie, wasn't it? They it, just started showing some No, it was, a, it, was, was it was similar. after the 40th. Oh, 2003. Oh, 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 that might be the UK Gold Repeats then. No, no, no. This was on, on, on BBC. Okay. Because they showed Spearhead. Then they showed Silurians. Yeah. And we thought they were going to go in order. But then they ended up doing Silurians, then Terror, then <laughs> Genesis of the Daleks. And then that was okay. it. Oh, so they just did like a little series of stories. Yeah, yeah. Fair yeah. dude. Probably, probably didn't do Ambassadors because at that point it hadn't been recolorized. And also it was very long. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's very yeah, long. Yeah. Seven weeks for Silurians definitely felt like forever. Um... <laughs> Come along, Joe. My number six might be a contentious one uh, because it's all some, opinion. Just a reminder: some people like it. Quality reminder: it's all about opinion, guys. Some people like it. Some people hate it. I love it because, despite the fact that it is almost incomprehensible, it has a wonderful dreamlike quality, and again shows uh, what you could do with this show if you let more uh, modern uh, hands play with it, Toy, manipulate it, if you will, um, and that is. Ghostlight, Ooh. starring Sylvester McCoy. It's three parts, and it should be four. There's definitely a chunk of it missing. It is. It is almost nonsensical. But like I say, there's this really, it's really um, intoxicating dream logic to it, and some yeah. fantastic imagery. McCoy and um, Sophie Aldred both on top form. Great guest performances. Uh, fantastic production design because of course what did the BBC do better than anyone else? Costume drama. You put do a costume drama and you put some sci-fi trappings on it. Boom. Great Doctor Who story. Three parts of nonsense. Absolute yeah, if nonsense. If people have ever wondered why there are so many stories set in the Victorian era in yeah. modern and classic it's because they got those costumes to hand. Yeah we got all that shit. It's like, fine. We have them and they're um, ready. <laughs> it was the last story filmed but it's like the start because when it was transmitted, it's the start of like the last trilogy yeah. of Who, which goes Ghostlight, Curse of Fenric, Survival, uh, which are very much a, a character arc for Ace, which was setting her, setting her up for what would have been season 27, because it is the 
again, they're bringing more of a narrative through line across stories into the show. Um, it's it's ghost like it's it's you either love it or you hate it. You either hate it because it doesn't make any sense, or you love it because it doesn't make any sense. So <laughs> it is a polarizing. Depends one. which camp you fall into, but I love it. I still it's haven't my seen that six. one. I, I'm so aware I've not watched it. It's very good, and I I'm obviously. looking forward to yeah. God damn it! That's a really good pick. Yes, motherfucker. That was that was a hard one. It's a really good pick because I now want to watch. I now want to watch it, but it will break the rules of our marathon. It will if, if I do. I say rules. I've been watching Doctor Who on the slide between anyway. Hey, um, hey well, you should. I've been cheating on Doctor Who with Doctor Who. Tell me your number six. Tell me, Don Miguel. I think I'm gonna have to save talking about this one for a bit later as well. Why is that? I'll make this nice and brick because I, I guarantee this is in your like top three probably. Um, but. Pyramids of Mars. Pyramids of Mars. Good God. It's definitely coming later on my list. Don't you worry about that. I mean, that. Tom, Elizabeth, uh, those mummy costumes, that freaking gorgeous shot where they walk into the doorway and immediately turn face. It <laughs> is. <laughs> uh, the production design. A priest hole in a Victorian Gothic folly. Nonsense. <laughs> production design. The, the freaking, the look, the, both looks of Sutek. Um, yeah. Gabrielle Wolf's voiceover just it's we're definitely going to talk about this later we'll be talking about this later on yeah don't worry about Pyramids of Mars is my number six I do Um, (laughs) uh, my number five coming back to one we've already touched on is Case of Androzani um oh okay right can we expand on this one now uh Peter Davison's last story. Mm. It's tense. It's got Sharaz Jack as a as a Shara's really compelling. Jack, what a, I mean, you couldn't get you villain. couldn't get away with that costume now, and I argue you probably didn't get away with it then. You know, they originally wanted Tim Curry for that. Really? Yeah, yeah. But they couldn't. They couldn't get all of him. I think because of scheduling. It was like, no, no. I'm not wearing you bondage have again. Um, <laughs> da, 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 there's all, there's all da, the stuff. Da, da, da. <sighs> it is. It is Phantom of the Opera. But in a mine that's also part of a civil war. Mm. There's the... Um... <laughs> what a brilliantly accurate yet also yeah. baffling description. I know, right? <laughs> it's got a couple of special effects fails with the um, <laughs> with the, the, the cave monster stuff and the, mm, and the yeah. bat. Oh, knife. shit, yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, the, the whole... The ticking... Again, the ticking clock of, of Perry Spectrox Toxemia and the Doctors later on... Um, the stuff with the androids, the android duplicates, the political intrigue, and it's all weaved together, and you get a real sense of this society of Androzani Minor and Major. Um, it's Robert Holmes scripts, isn't it? So Robert again, Holmes. that's that's yeah. where you get all that stuff from. You got the mercenaries who are great. Yes, um, of course. Just... Of course, we've got some like a weird little double act in the Robert Holmes yeah. story. Of and of course, you just got Peter Davison driving the whole thing. Yeah. Well, like I like... said, that was that's the story that made me go. I get why people yeah. like his doctor. I Everything get it. becomes more and more desperate and his intensity just boots it up. And he's just doing everything he can to save it, to save someone he again he, he barely knows. Even in the aesthetics, just just the visuals, like that squeaky clean costume, I think that's the only story I can think of where it gets fucked. Oh, oh. yeah, he gets they yeah, he gets real messed up. Um It sort of really it really emphasizes that like, yeah, no, this is this is a live or die kind of scenario. This is a this is an end game for this doctor, um, which leads to one of my favourite sort of post regeneration moments. As yeah, because well. the regeneration is really traumatic. Like he dies. This squeaky clean hero dashing doctor dies at first hearing in his head the voices of his friends like calling to him to hold on, and then the voice of his is. You know, his arch enemy, the master, taunting him and telling him to die. Yeah. And it's like... It's all the... Whoa! I think it's... It's not the first time, but it's... They bring all the companions back. They do it for Tom as well, don't they? Um... All the companions pop up. Yeah, no, but but like in in this thing, it's that whole thing of them calling out. Yeah. Like, it's like, oh my God, he's going to make it. That reused footage, this actually has new dialogue and stuff. Yeah, Um, It's like, is he going to make it? Is he going to make it? Like, everyone whose lives he's touched, like, they're there inside him, like, willing him on. And then it's the fact that it's just the no, die, doctor, die. You're like, cool, sanely comes back for that. And it works. Yeah. And he so it's actually quite... It's a heroic death for a doctor, but it's also really sad. And then, like some of the most fun regenerations, immediately, <laughs> complete tone change. Yeah. But seen through the eyes of Perry, who 
has only been with him for, again, presumably like a couple days. Yeah. Who's already like baffled that this man sacrificed himself to save her, to make sure she's safe and protected. And then suddenly he's different. She's not been around him long enough to just imagine, to be like, oh God, he's changed. Is this another weird alien thing I'm seeing? Yeah. Like that must be shocking as hell because she's not prepared for it. It just happens. And then, and then this it's, blonde guy sits It's bloody up Colin as well. And is instantly just sort of a bit, a little bit d- dismissive. Oh, he's a bit, he's a cock. He's a proper cock. Was it do- Doctor? Are we expecting someone else? I... I, I uh, three eyes in one sentence. That makes you sound like a rather egotistical young lady. <laughs> what, what's happened? Um, Change, my dear. And it's Down the seems, barrel. And it, it seems not a moment too soon. soon. Amazing, like, end to an ep- a regeneration story. And then we get the twin yeah, dilemma. Doesn't quite, <laughs> it's like, damn it. Doesn't no. quite stick the land in there. But, um, love that. But what's, what's your number five? My number five, we won't have to talk about this much longer because we've already talked about it quite in depth. Oh, it's Remembrance of the Daleks. Hey! It, it is, it is, it is the first uh, Dalek story to pop up in my top ten. Um, I love it. Absolutely, absolutely adore it. Again, it's like we said before, it's those moments like the yeah. conversation in the cafe or the Dalek hovering up the stairs for the first time or just, or even, even that weird on the nose Easter egg that I, I forgive. Oh, the, the and now, like, oh, now science, science fiction, fiction yeah, yeah. Anyway, Doctor, and it cuts away. Yeah. You're just like, great. Like, fair enough, I'll allow it. But again, it would have made more sense if it was the 25th anniversary story. Yeah. If it was the 25th anniversary story, that would have sat even better. Because you, you'd forgive it in that moment by being, oh, go on. I guarantee, you made a nod to the first one. I guarantee on. it was the 25th anniversary story. Mm. And then John Nathan Turner was like, oh, it's the silver anniversary, so we've got to do something with silver. Cybermen! Let's do a Cyberman one! John, No. Oh, John. Guarantee We're, it. As showrun- as showrunner as it was, it wasn't called back then, but, you know, yeah, yeah. we have a lot to thank him for. We also have a lot to go, John, for Christ's John, sake. John, for fuck's uh, sake. And that's not going into the personal stuff. Um, but, yeah, that Remembrance of the Daleks is my number five, and and it is one of the, it is one of the few Dalek stories that I will um, watch in, in, in its entirety in one sitting as well. Yep. Like, a lot of them I'll sprinkle out, whereas that one I'm just like, no, nah, put it on. Put it yeah. on. I'm watching Remembrance of the Daleks. Get it in my eyes. What's your number four, um, Sonny Jim? It's the oldest story in my top ten. Oh, mint. Uh, it's the only black and whiter. And it is, it's is—it's been a favourite of mine since it was released on VHS very shortly after being rediscovered when I was the tender age of five years old. It's Patrick Troughton in Tomb of the Cybermen. Hey! Um, hands down, I think, the best use of the Cybermen in... Sorry, do you, don't you mean the Cybermen? The best use of the Cybermen. Yeah, the Cybermen. The, yes. In all of Doctor Who, modern and classic. Um, it's the best use of Eric Klieg in the show. Oh, Eric Klieg. <laughs> Although, if you want oh. more Eric Klee, go check out the Endless One. There is some, audios, there is some dodgy uh, racial, racial stereotyping stuff in there. Stuff yeah, in there yeah. that, um, which, you know, hasn't aged very well. So, we got to put that out front there. It's like, yeah, there's some there's some racism stuff in this, which is a bit like... It doesn't a, It doesn't have a stranglehold on the viewing experience as a whole. No, no. But, it is a bit but you watch it and you go, ooh, yeah. 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 Manservants. Um, yeah. And it's... But yeah. it's... Which, I think... Were it were it simply just a case of different casting or yeah. a mix of ethnicity of the the rest of the cast, it wouldn't have felt as weird because it was more just a case of yeah, oh, yeah. like that guy's just like the muscle and the servant to the thingy. Yeah, yeah. But it comes across as oh, the one black guy in the story is the man. Sla- yeah, slavery's okay. back in vogue, eh? Yeah. Um, so that that's like oh god. It's, it's also one and, of those... and it's not intended to be that at all. But it is just like that is some blind fucking casting you've done there, guys. Yeah. You should have thought about this. It ends. <laughs> fantastically bleakly it's yeah. one of those stories where like n- I think all the guest characters die yeah oh god I think yeah. it's only the decided crew that get out of there alive yeah. this is what this is one um, of those like nobody survives the situation stories I could be wrong about that and yet has some of the it's warmest moments um it's yeah the doctor talking to, to Victoria about his family yeah which is that's wonderful absolutely beautiful um and you watch that back and go oh Patrick Troughton because it's Victoria's first story as a companion because she joins the crew at the end. It pick, this story picks up directly from the last episode of New Evil, the Daleks. Mm-hmm. They're on Scarrow. Yeah. And then they're, le- and then they're leaving. Um, and Victoria's family's 
uh, her father's been killed and she's all on her own and they and they take her with her it's got some great um See, that's the thing nobody does what we're doing and all that stuff yeah but basically just comforting and being like you know, come with us. We're going to take care of you. Adventure. What we're about to do, like where the places yeah. we go, this is brilliant, and no one else is doing it, and that's what makes this special. And you're like, that's amazing. The bit where he's like, they first arrive at the base and stuff, and he sort of offers to hold her hand, and Jamie is the one who yeah. holds his hand, and then they both sort of realise, look at each other and have that ah moment. There is, uh, which is hilarious because you're like, don't pretend like you two when, are in love. When I say run, <laughs> run like a rabbit. Um, oh god the, you got um, some nice Doctor and Jamie as well which is obviously yep. one of the best pairings in the show his taunting of Klieg yes and like he's just poking the bear on that one the tomb itself the, just uh, that the, wall oh, the doorway gorgeous design oh my um, god that, that sort of and again a bit, a bit of a ticking a bit of a ticking clock as well like because it's yeah. building up to the moment where and, they all oh, start to it's, awaken it's the end of episode 2 I think where they just mm. they, you just see them push their way out of the tomb yeah oh, and the cyber control and you will be like us. Um, you will be like us. It's very good. It's great. Great. The, little fat, the little post box mouths at that point, and they look really creepy. And it's it's very good. Um, I don't think it's that short. Look at Jamie's. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Two of the Cybermen. Men. Right. It's amazing. What's your number four, Cocker? My number four is a number four story. Uh, I think it's also one of the first times they did proper location filming. I think definitely the first time they shot abroad at City of Death. Oh, um, yeah. Fourth well, Doctor and the Romana story, yeah. I will go straight ahead and say that my number three is City of Death. Oh, brilliant. So, so let's, let's talk about let's it. Let's talk about go. City of Death. <laughs> let's talk about City of Death. So my number four, your number three. Beautiful. Uh, City of Death is freaking wonderful. It's 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 Douglas Adams. It's very... Du- I think it's the most Douglas Adams of his Doctor Who's. Yeah. In terms of like... Yeah. It, it, it comes away as like a... If someone said... That's the same guy as Hitchhiker's. You go, oh yeah, no, I could see that. I yeah. could totally feel that when I was watching it. It's just got that sort of bonkers. The same as in the same, like... as in, same as in the Pirate Planet. It's got that sort of the way it plays with sci-fi tropes and as ridiculous names for things, and it <laughs> and it's just like tongue in cheek things like this is a fake being written on several copies of, of the, the Mona, Mona Lisa, Lisa in UV like thingy. So it could be, um, oh god, Duggan, who doesn't have a fucking clue what's going on. But he just walks in and hits things. Doggins freaking great! Like, oh god, um, and yeah, it's it, it, it's quintessentially quintessentially British throughout as well. Yeah, even though it's set in France, and which is such a wonderful kind of juxtaposition, and written on a weekend under pressure. Yeah, like the hell, and Douglas all, Adams. Of course, it, this is this is the period when they were getting together. So the chemistry between Tom and Lala is brilliant. Yeah, it's he's just, got. Amazing dialogue in this. She's whip smart. And, oh god, and, and, this was that. This was the one that made me for, uh, for the longest time made me just fall in love with Romana. Yeah, like, she's I fancy, brilliant. I, I watched this. this first time when I was about fifteen. I just fancied the pants off. Oh, she's award. amazing in this. I was like, she's so good. Um, but again, like just the dialogue, just the, the throwaway lines. My, what a wonderful butler. He's so, so violent. Oh, just. The, and all, the that, that interview scene where where they get that <laughs> they've been captured and they, they get brought into the living room. It's like, it's the, like, the, the, polite, it's like the politest interrogation. Yeah, ever. And it just <laughs> and it's the moment. Is I don't he, think I he's, he's as stupid, stupid as he looks. No one could be as stupid <laughs> as he looks. And it's just and you, get, you get the shot to the shot to end a thousand gifts of him just grinning and going, little waving <laughs> his fingers. Um, he's full loon in this. I think it's the I think it's probably the last time you see Tom. <laughs> Like fully lit up and engaged, invested in the and material, invested in it. Because yeah. I think after this, he starts to go be a bit. Oof. And he don't. <laughs> so, so was it the five fans video? It was like you uh, have caught me joining season eighteen, so I really don't give a shit. <laughs> yeah. uh, he just he just doesn't have that sort of spark again. And not to say that he's not like I've got a soft spot for stuff like the Leisure Hive and Logopolis, mm. but he's not the same. He's more wist- he's more wistfully yeah. uh, like melancholic kind of yeah. eccentricity after this. I think this is the last sort of <clears throat> he's having a ball. Up. Yeah, I think you might, might have been because they had a weekend in Paris. <laughs> that yes. might be why. And I think we made the show and we bargained off to Paris. And I think there's around some of it, it in <laughs> Shada as well. I think if Shada had been finished, there's definitely some of it in the Shada nar- <laughs> opening narration yeah. from the VHS. Shada. Oh, sh- um, yeah, no, I, I think that would from the what you can see of Shada, that stuff's in there. Um, so <laughs> yeah, I think it's definitely the Adams. I think the Douglas Adams is bringing it out. In what's him. it? It's Scarath, isn't it? Scarath, last of the Jaggeroth. Yeah, we're just we 
to, again, another tear in the face off cliffhanger reveal moment. Oh, Julian Glover Freaky just being Julian Glover loving fantastic. it. Uh, freaking the story get in Paris, but a bit in freaking Italy. Da Vinci's like workshops, yep. and then and then we're at the end of we're at the beginning of time, like at the primordial soup of Earth, yep. and it's like so much visually going on in a story that's quite again small, and you can do in one sitting so easily. Yeah, um, and that the end gag with John Cleese. <laughs> Oh, it's not the end. It's to, it's towards it's toward it's, the end. Yeah, I think it's not like during episode. Oh yeah, because of course Duggan goes it's with John, them, It's John Cleese it? yeah. and Eleanor yeah. Bron. Yes, because they parked in a gallery, <laughs> and it just and the three of them run into the TARDIS. <laughs> exquisite, exquisite, exquisite. <laughs> they, run into ta- <laughs> they run into the TARDIS. It's one of the few blatantly comedy moments yeah. in all of Doctor Who where it's just this is here to make you go what, and then have a laugh, <laughs> and then they move on. They just run into the TARDIS, it sets off, the two of them in the art gallery, the two like critics were really posh and wanky and everything, barely react to it, de- dematerialising, and they just think it's part of the exhibit. Yeah. Love it. wonderful. Love it. And wasn't, wasn't that just like they were they were making something else I think like, so. next and door? I think so, and they just popped along. Like, come on in, like, we'll, come and do this we'll film a cameo. Great. Love it. What's um, not to love about City of Death? My number four, your number three. Yeah, it's 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 that good. It is pretty. Good, it's that yeah. good. Uh, what's your number three, Cocker? Uh, if we're if weirdly continuing the pattern of number co- corresponding with Doctor, number three is my favorite um, first story for a Doctor in terms of like the the, the first yes their, their first adventure after regenerating. I know what this is, and it's very good. Um, it's the story that made me fall in love with Doctor Who. The, the TV movie was the first one I saw and made me go, "What is this?" Yeah. But this was the first one that I watched. Again, I think it was a it was a UK Gold or a BBC repeat in the late 90s was how it, when I first saw this. Yeah. And I just fell head over heels because it was a big reason for one of the greatest fears I had as a child. Um, it meant that the Doctor involved was my favourite Doctor pretty much until the new series began because I just fell in love with his attitude and his delivery. Um, and I was so chuffed that due to circumstances it's one of the few that we currently have in blu-ray condition because yeah. of it all being shot on film yeah. it's shot spearhead from space yeah yeah the, for the first full color story the first third doctor story first pertwee first uh story with alistair lethbridge stewart as the brigadier yeah um first liz shaw first autons like oh my god i love spirit from space so much and it's a mix of things. It's the, again, it's the first time since I think, I think the last story like this was the invasion where it was just like set contemporary Earth. Yeah, which is also the last time you see um, <clears throat> um, Lethbridge Stewart. Lethbridge Stewart because he, he pops up in Web of Fear, then Unit pop up proper, I think. Yeah, in during Invasion. Invasion. Yeah, and then that becomes they become the. The, the default setting for the next setting. four seasons. Yeah, like like a bit le- a bit less toward the end of those four, like yeah. as, as the Doctor begins to be able to travel again. But it's just this brilliant thing. It's been cast out by the Time Lords, essentially banished. They've sent him to Earth. They've forced him to regenerate. The TARDIS doesn't work beyond just the basic controls, and that's it. Yep, it, that could be the end of the show. <laughs> to and, use, and nearly to use was. common internet yeah. whining. Com- whining parlance but it, it really wasn't because they had faith in their supporting cast they were yeah. like right you're you're not just gonna have the doctor and a friend or two traveling you're gonna have the doctor you're gonna have the brigadier you're gonna have uh yates yeah you're gonna have um freaking liz and then eventually joe obviously you're gonna have recurring villains um like th- this is this is the direction we're going now yeah and because the casting is so good and because the writers really st- get sink their teeth into the supporting cast and the more Quatermass meets Bond-esque tone of that first year. Oh, yeah. It's, it's again, it's the conviction. It's done with such conviction that you can't help but go, Boy, all it? right, let's let's see where you're going with this. Yeah. And Spearhead is such a great one to start with. Um, political intrigue is in there. Um, the espionage elements there. The, the All that stuff. But also, living mannequins that smash through shop windows and murder people. Just an absolutely iconic sequence. So frightening that when I realised I'd, I'd moved down the road from that oh, Marks and Spencer's man. where that shot, that shot is, 
uh, and lived there for a year and a bit, I kept, I shat myself on the way to work like every day because that shot was so ingrained into my head. And also, you got quite scared, but mostly it was just because you <laughs> were eating pizza a lot. Yeah, I was just like too like, much Domino's. Oh, that's how I found out I was lactose intolerant. <laughs> shit myself on the way to work every morning. The also um, made me do it. I swear, he yes. said, biting into his third raw chunk of Cathedral City. <laughs> Oh, no, no. How many bags of Cathedral City can you fit in your mouth? Um, <laughs> All of them. <laughs> um, it's so good. The, the, the nesting consciousness that is a threat that is completely unseen. And then when we get a glimpse of what it is, it's horrifying. Lee bad. Well, yeah, it's not well executed. <laughs> uh, it doesn't help that sort of, if for some reason, it has a fascination with grabbing Pertwee's nose. But again, it's, it's so it sort of looks you know, more comedic than than scary. But even so, it's that era that of Doctor Who, it's, well, it's, it's like living dummies. idea versus execution. Like, but but, but it's, I mean, I, I'd, I'd still argue that the tendrils coming out of the machine is pretty haunting. Just, it's a fucking nitpick, just, like, just isn't because, it? Like, yeah, but just because like the whole thing is dummies and glowing orbs, and you're like, what the hell could the thing be that's behind all this? And then you get these Cthulhu esque tendrils yeah. coming out of a machine. You're like. Okay, that's not what I was expecting. I think the New Adventures retconned the Nestine to be one of the Lovecraft Elder Gods. I wouldn't be surprised. Because they, they they do that with a bunch of, like, the Great Intelligence is supposed to be um, Nyalathotep. And I Fair think, enough. Uh, I'm guessing it was one of those, they're in the public domain. Great, retcon. Basically. Yeah. Um, it was the... Um, well, the Seventh Doctor stuff in the New Virgin Adventures becomes very kind of I think it was David Lovecraft inspired, David A. M- M- McKinty. Yeah, he wrote a few stories, and he loves that. Loves that shit. Um, <laughs> well, it works, and and I'd buy it for the nesting absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's it's great, and it just it made me excited when I finally sort of started to collect the DVDs. It made me excited to watch this Doctor's journey. It made me excited, even though I knew that there was one more story, to see the Autons again. Yeah, it's great, and just just little things. As post regeneration goes, I love the fact that he sort of recovers a bit. And there's instantly just like, right, I've got to fuck off. I've got to go and get the Tardis and leave now. Shoes. 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 And freaking just singing like the lyrics to the Jabberwock poem whilst he's having a shower. <laughs> it's like, what is going on? It's great. John Pertwee. It's great. John and it made me fall in love with Pertwee. And he, until the new series began, um, it, he was my doctor because of this yeah. story. Yeah. And, and yeah. It, always, was him, it was him I'm and Tom for me growing up. But Tom, Tom edged it for me. Um, hey! <laughs> He's still an enthusiasm at that point, did he? Speaking of which... Oh, you're number two. Speaking Please number two. do not throw hands at me. Oh my God. The Robots of Death. Hey now, girl! I knew you'd pick that one somewhere. It's It was very nearly my number one. <laughs> uh, very nearly to the point where I switched them around about... 30 seconds before we started recording. He was. He was hunched um, up all over the counter in the kitchen with a pen just going, no, wait, no, yes. And just scribbling out and like writing um, stuff. It's a murder mystery on a futuristic space mine where everyone wears silly hats. Yeah. It's got D84 <laughs> and Poole. Yes. It's got Taron Capel. Yes. It's got Leela. Yes. It's oh, got Peak Leela. The Peak Leela. It's her second Leela. story. It's got the wonderful explanation of uh, dimensional transcendentalism. Of course, that's from Robots of Death, yeah, isn't it? It's, yeah. If you could, if you could have that one there, and this one here, but also in the same space, then the big one would fit inside the small one. That's silly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Welcome to Doctor Who, Leela. It's, <laughs> Welcome aboard. It's the uh, it's the wooden panel control room. Uh, yeah, the, the yeah. Console control room. room. Control room. B. Um, <laughs> it's uh, the Vox. And that great Art Deco design. Mm-hmm. Oh, they're, they're, again, simultaneously as gorgeous as they are horrifying to look at. Yeah. Like, the, the change of lighting and a pair of red eyes and they become frightening. It's Yuvanov and, and Tuse. It's it's the Doctor getting stuck inside a silo and a little straw popping up for him to breathe through. I mean, what? I, it's the bicycle reflectors. Being a major prop, and people making out that they're not, there's something else. Um, uh, I I I have so much love for the robots of death. It is wonderful. It is just one of my favourites. It was one of the earliest DVDs released. Yeah, and, and I such um, suffered from the terrible front cover syndrome of that yeah. first batch. Like, but, Spear, Spearhead was another one. 
But I still love it. It's just, here's a blurry photograph of the monster. Yeah. There you go, that's your cover. But it's still one of my go-tos. Absolutely one of my go-tos. Have you picked up the special since? No. Um, Because I think it's in one of the the Revisitations box sets. I think I I, I, I waited for the Revisitations before I got it, because before that I'd watched it with you. Um, I think think the only time I'd seen it prior to that was with yourself. Um, I love it. In fact, it's so much so that... um, Was it... Was it... Your birthday or your dad's birthday recently where you just decided to sit down and watch Robot? It was, fa- it was Father's, Father's Day. Day, that was it. I was at my dad's, we were having a drink and we just said, oh, let's watch some classic Who. So I said, I mean, you, could have watched, you could have watched Father's Day if you were doing New Who. And... No, we wanted to enjoy ourselves. Um, rather hey, than cry. Father... Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Um, how dare you besmirch the greatest series of television. And he brought down Robots to Death and was like, yeah, let's do that. <laughs> good show. Let's do that. Oh, God. It's so good. It is damn good. And I can't, I can't tell you how much I love it accurately. But there's still one more that I love more, which we'll get to very shortly. What's your number two? My number two. Uh, my number two. My second favorite Doctor Who story from the classic era. Um, I had the pleasure of rewatching again recently, and it just reaffirmed my love for it. Uh, it. It. I. I. I'll tell you what. It's so good. I wouldn't rewrite it. Not one line. Ah. Because it's the Aztecs. The Aztecs um, is wonderful. The fifth. The fifth Doctor Who story. Um, is it only the fifth? Yeah, uh, Unearthly Child, Daleks, Edge of Destruction, Marco Polo, and then the Aztecs. No, yeah. no, 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 no. Oh no, no, Keys of Mariners. Keys of Mariners. The Aztecs. You're right. Yes, yeah, so it's the sixth. Yeah. Um, it's it is it's just it it just is. I mean, it it it's the first time where they really utilize Barbara yep. and her skill set in that she's a history teacher, which she gets to use it a bit in Marco Polo. But it's that Tardis crew properly having settled in. Yeah, having a dynamic. Yeah, and then like the Doctor has warmed to Ian and Barbara by this point. He's not as crotchety yeah. and pissy. I think the Keys of Marinus is the story that solidifies his fondness for them. But he ca- yeah, he cares about them now. Yeah, because when he defends um, Ian in the trial and the Keys of Marinus, it's like he's doing it because he knows it's the right thing and Ian's a good man. Yeah, and it's like good. He's invested in, in these people that he he was trying to threaten. Shannon is a good man. <laughs> yeah, the just look, get, get, find the fornicator. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> Radiation gloves. Um, <laughs> Keys of Marinus isn't on anyone's top ten list, is it? Let's be honest. I enjoy the Keys of Marinus. I'm not saying the, it's the, bad. The Vordot, great. But I'm not the... saying it's bad, but it's, it's pretty bad. But you get a couple of solo Ian and Barbara stories where they're being awesome. Yeah, that's true. Like that's fighting true. back uh, ghosts that are suits of armor alive inside wintry mountains. <laughs> We're gonna um, melt the ice. It's so good, um, uh, but uh, yeah, the Aztecs is wonderful we'll because it, again, it's pure historical, and it's it's the best part because it utilizes Barbara's abilities. Like as a history teacher, she's passionate about history; she loves yeah. it. Yeah, which means that it brings out the best and the worst in her because she can't see past her own beliefs about this period um, to understand that interfering is not something they should be doing. Yeah, like the doctor makes a point of we cannot like like I said like we can't we cannot rewrite history like not one line I know believe me I know and you're just like okay like he's for the first time ever he's like no I'm being serious don't do this but she's like they sacrificed hundreds of thousands of people for the sake of the weather of crops growing like believing it to be appeasing gods it's so unnecessary and I want to stop it. Yeah. So of course they arrive, they arrive inside, the, a great setup, they arrive inside the temple uh, uh, through the door which only the architect knows how to get in. Yeah. Because because, it's the, because the idea it's the, is that the gods, the, the gods would arrive if they were to come to earth, they would arrive and they would exit. And, and exit. In human form. Um, and she's believed to be Yataxa. Um but uh, there's so many great characters. She's a high priestess, Yataxa. Yeah, I mean, Christ, Tlatoxel. Like, oh, if you so want a good. really, really freaking great Doctor Who villain, Tlatoxel. Uh, the, like, the, he's the, the high sacrificial um, priest. He's, he's slimy. He's, hor- he's horrible. He enjoys murder. Mm-hmm. He instantly rumbles them and tries to sort of prove to everyone that she's a false goddess. <laughs> and all that stuff. <laughs> Proper boo his baddie. If you can see any colour photographs of it, there are some on the behind the scenes features. God, it's lush. Yeah. Like, it works really well in black and white, but when you see yeah. what the costumes look like in colour, it's beautiful. Uh, the sets are fantastic. Uh, Susan and Ian both get really sort of interesting and kind of 
tense subplots. Like Susan's at first seems a bit like, oh, they're trying to marry her off. That seems really stupid. And so you realise toward the end, it's like, oh God, she's being used as leverage. Yeah. Oh, that's really scary. Ian gets his hands dirty in like one of his most rough and tumble. Yeah, Ian gets to do some stories. action, which is really cool. Uh, they're, they're, they're taking the guy down with his thumb. Yeah. Which is brilliant because then they believe that, oh my God, he must be the servant of your taxa. Like if he can do that, yeah. he's powerful enough to do that. And it's just, it's simply just a self-defense thing that he's learned, which yeah. is great. And the doctor getting accidentally married by sharing a sharing Coco. Oh, the doctor in Kameka is really sweet as and, well. and she seems really upset because people, I know I've seen people criticize it, be like, oh, why would she just fall in love? Like immediately, it's like, it's not that. She's been around these people all of her life. She's got a very specific job. She's within sort of the, 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 the high priest's kind of um, world. Um, because she knew the architects, she's been a part of the temple. She's married to the architect. She's married to the architect. She's married to the architect. Bribed the architect. Hey. I travelled further back and bribed the architect. Um, so there's all that. So you, it, it's the fact that she meets this older man who's just immediately lovely and interested in her because he's genuinely like, if I'm going to be here while Barbara figures this out, yeah, I'm going to enjoy myself and I'm going to learn the history and I'm going to learn more about the place. And and she she sees his enthusiasm and, and warmth and everything, and she's instantly sort of taken by him to the point where she doesn't trick him into marrying her because she believes he knows what the, what it means yeah, with yeah. the sharing of the cocoa. Um, so she's not only upset when he has to go, but she also feels kind of betrayed because he just wanted to know how to get into the temple. Yeah, and he wasn't being he wasn't being um. It wasn't being intentionally duplicitous. Yeah, uh, and so he knows how much it hurts her, and it's really sweet, and the way she and Hart will play it, it's so good. It's a great story. The Aztecs is fantastic. Yeah. There's the horrible shock moment with the sacrifice, like Barbara interrupts it, so the sacrifice, the guy who was going to be the sacrifice runs and leaps off of the pyramid to his death. Yeah. Because, like, and she's like, why why the hell? Like, I just stopped, and it's like, because it is dishonourable, yeah. and like, he feels like it's an insult. It, it, it is an insult for him to not live out what he was destined to do, which was to be the blood sacrifice. Yeah, like you, the only way to purify himself was to kill himself in his, like to purify himself in his own eyes. And it's like, oh god, she's making it worse. It's it's so good. The Aztecs yeah. is amazing. Pure historical. I think it's the best pure historical. Oh, hands down, um, hands down. And it's got one of the best villains from the sixties run. Yeah, it's really good Hartnell, but more than anything, it's fantastic. Jacqueline. Yeah. As, as Barbara. It's, she's it's definitely Barbara's showcase yeah. moment of, of the series. She's amazing. And yeah, the Aztecs, just buy it. Watch it now, people. Right now. Get it in your eyes. Now, before we crack on to our number one. Yes. I think it only fair. Our numbers ones. That we whack out a few honourable mentions that didn't quite make our top tens. All right. I've got a big list. Oh. Should we go one by one see what we got? Um, oh, we'll get to you, you, you yours and then I'll do mine. Send the actress to the bishop. Curse of Fenric. Hey! That was a great one. It's yeah. great, and it was very close between Curse of Fenric and Ghostlight and Survival. So yeah, Curse of Fenric and Survival. I love that last season of um, McCoy of McCoy and Aldred. Oh, maybe not Barfield. Um, but no, Barfield's got moments. It's, it's, got but some it's, fun it's stuff definitely in it. the weaker of the four. Um, yeah. it's, got, it's got Brigadier Bambera. What are you gonna do? Um, <laughs> she's great. Uh, and the Knight, whatever he's called. Is, oh, they're, they're funny. Um, it's. It's got a damn interesting costume in it. But, yes, yeah. also that. Um, and it's also... But yeah, Curse of Fenric. It's it's vampires, uh, Norse mythology, uh, World War Two, Blue soccer uh, faces. Ace meeting her own ancestors mm. without realising it. It's got um, great makeup with the, the Hemovores. Mm. It's got... Um, Evil, evil scientist man possessed by Fenric. It's got Nicholas Parsons. <laughs> what more do you want? It's got that wonderful, wonderful moment where the Doctor um, protects himself with faith by reciting the names of his companions. Yeah, the thing he has the, mo- the most faith in mm. um, is that, and it's also the beginning of him. That was that was the thing that made me sort of realize yeah. like years ago because I was big in, like into Buffy the Vampire Slayer and things like that. That's the thing that made me realize because I was hypothet- that hypothetical of if I'm a vampire, yeah. holding a cross wouldn't work because I'm I'm atheist. Yeah, like it wouldn't it wouldn't make sense. Like it might freak them out because like the symbolism of it, but, but you it, don't have to be faith, faith behind it. it. Yeah, and that was the story that made me realize. Oh God, yeah, it's it's about faith. It's about faith. So like you you know just as long as you believe in something, you can use that as a weapon against a vampire. Yeah. Um, um, Chris Fenwick's great again that's how you do continuity in a, in a good way yeah 
Let's say you reference continuity in a way that isn't jarring or, or, or off-putting. Is and it also, it? it's got a great novelization as well. Um, just incidentally. Um, also, what else we got? Done that one, done that one. Seed of Doom. The Tom Baker one, not the Patrick Trout one. Yeah. The one with the plant people, where the first two episodes is basically the thing. Yeah. And then it's like, and then it becomes a giant monster story. It, it's awesome. And man, is the villain nuts in that. Harrison Chase. Yeah. Uh, just his black glove wearing um, plant maniac who plays electronica to his plants and mulches people to feed to them. Like, what? It It's ace. <laughs> It is really good, and also it's a Tom, it's a, it's a Tom and Liz story, so it automatically is is in the top end. Resurrection of the Daleks, yeah, um, the, Peter uh, Davis's Dalek Peter story, Davison's, yeah. um, absolute bloodbath, um, and but again, it's it's start, it actually starts an ongoing narrative with the Daleks and Davros because it's because at the end of that story is when you get the Renegade Imperial split. Mm. Um, yeah, it begins that arc that, yeah. that is is the arguably the strength of that, that the choice to keep Davros coming back, which gets picked up on in Revelation of the Daleks, which is also an honorable mention. That again, hey. best Colin Baker story, hands down. Even though he's not really in it, like as a, as a major player, he just sort of observes the events. How many episodes is Revelation? Is it three. It's two forty-five minute episodes. Ah, right. Because that in in the that season twenty-two. Mm. They experimented. I say experimented. They they guy they had less episodes because their budgets cut with making them um, forty five minute episodes and fewer episodes per story. Mm-hmm. Um, which is why like you've got uh, Varos and stuff like that. Varos is two is two forty five minute episodes. Uh, two Doctors was three forty five minute episodes. Uh, Revelation was two. Attack of the Sad Men was two. Yeah, etc. etc. Um, and they ditched it because it didn't work um, and of course on repeats stop you said it's like a sound man it's um, good music uh, of course on repeats it's, they make it it was re-edited into 25 minutes four 25 minute episodes oh okay um, I imagine yeah. that makes the cliffhangers really difficult to be interesting well yeah because the first cliffhanger is the um, no it can't be because the set in the in the actual five minute one, it's the first cliffhanger is the statue falling them, isn't it? Statue? Don't you mean giant, giant polystyrene, polystyrene face. block of Colin's yeah. face? And it's things like that that keep it out of my top ten. But it's actually a really great. It's a pretty much a great story. Again, Robert Holmes. What are you gonna do? Robert um, the War Games. I love it. Yeah, yeah. But it's too fucking long. It's ten. It's so long. But there's some really great epic stuff in there. And boy, that last episode is huge. That last one perfect. is just is fucking milky, milky fun. It is. It is so good. Um, Earth shock. Because again, did it leave you Earth shock? I'm it, so sorry. It left me Earth shock. Um, I'm so sorry. I'm it's so sorry. aliens, but with Cybermen. And Adric dies. So what's not to like? Um, a couple of Pertwee gems. The Damons. Yeah, Demos chat with the wings five rounds rapid. Yeah, uh, like you want to get me, you want to get me interested in something uh, occultism, <laughs> British folklore. Sorry, are you appealing to the viewers to get you, the listeners yeah. to get you into cultism? Occulti- occultism, <laughs> not cultism, occultism. Oh, well, both of them. British folklore and witchcraft, <laughs> and Morris dancers. No, um, British folklore and witchcraft, and uh, uh, excuse me. Frightening Morris Tanser's yes. kind of maybe. Um, and demons. Mm. There you go. That's that's me. I'm I'm there. I'm there. The demons is pretty damn sweet. It's so good. Um and also Cannibal of Monsters. Yes! because uh, yeah, awkward. The, the two um, <laughs> the awkward uh meta narrative there. Yes. Okay, yeah. terrible, terrible, terrible. It gave us the greatest uh, fucking the, the, the toy greatest, ever made. It's the greatest. Everyone loves Drashigs. Um the <laughs> double act of um Scherner uh, and Vorg. Um, that's bad names, isn't it? Vorg and Scherner. Yes. Um, and Ooh, the, the yes. miniscope. An early appearance from me and Marta, who would let it go on and be Harry Sullivan yeah. and be wonderful. Um, oh, just Harry, the, lovely Harry. The the political stuff of <laughs> that's on the planet of the of them scheming against each other and just being disgusted by these. He's got these grey skinned bald dudes who are disgusted by everything else. <laughs> um, yeah, I love Carnival Monsters. It's great fun. Uh, Talons of Wang Chiang, racist. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's problematic. It's problematic. There's some yellow face in there, which is 
Mm. It, it's problematic. It never intended to be offensive. Obviously, does not excuse how offensive and problematic it is. Yeah. But again, you put that hat on when you go into it. Yeah. Focus on what, the focus on the no, but like focus on <laughs> focus on the good. There's a damn good like story in there. It's a Sherlock Holmes, Jack the Ripper pastiche melded into one, but of, of course it's got some Fu Manchu stuff in it. So yeah, it's, that's it, is, not it, it has some unfortunate yellow peril, but um, it's also got Jago and Lightfoot, okay, uh, and and it's got Mister Sin as a creepy freaking little prop. It's uh, like prop. In fact, so it turns out to be more than a prop. I'm go- I'm going to just rattle off some great Tom Baker stories. Are you ready? Go. The Ark in Space, Genesis of the Daleks, the Santaran Experiment, the Brain of Morbius, um, Talents of Wang Chang I've done, what else? Seeds of Doom I've done. Uh, the Power of Kroll. The, the, actually, it's not that bad. Um, but no, the Reboss Operation is the other, is, yeah. and the Stones of Blood, they're the other two from the, the key it's of time. Is the one with the... When, when he slaps him in the gloves, yeah. yeah. And, it's, and it's, the, it's the two con men on this sort of like feudal planet. Yeah. So it's a bunch of space dudes come to this feudal planet to do a deal. Yeah. But one guy's like a war criminal and he's tr- and these two con men are trying to play him. Yeah. Sorry, I just that. And it's, yeah, the, just Tom's fucking face during that, the, the glove slap moment. It's beautiful. You won't forget the time you crossed the graph in decay. <laughs> um, uh, planet of Evil, I have a really soft spot for. Um, <laughs> I wasn't expecting that delivery. It's yeah, oh, it's like uh, nearly all of the stories from Tom's first three seasons. Terror of the Zygons, mm. love Terror yeah. of the Zygons. Oh God, of oh, Christ! You know, I first saw that on a preview disc before the DVD release because it was a late DVD release. That one, yeah, yeah. I yeah. saw it on a preview disc for Time Team because um, we did the little section that like that. Watch this, yeah. And they wanted to talk about Zygons when we were talking about uh, Aliens of London and World War Three. Uh, the whole like body shifting people pretending to be someone else sort of thing um, so I was sent a preview copy of the as then in the works to entertain DVD and I had to keep stuff stum-, stum about it stum I had to keep stum I was like stum okay. you really just cool. borrow my VHS copy well, that's true that's true but I got to have pickers with the special features oh so, um, yeah right what are your honourable mentions before we reveal our number ones my honourable munchons are you handsome git yes horror fang rock I completely forgot about <laughs> horror fang rock <laughs> Because I loves I loves me a monster. Hold story. on, I've got to I've got to redo my entire top ten. No, uh, no, 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 no. Yeah, horror fan. I, lo- I loves me a horror story. I loves me a monster, like just a straight up oh, monster story. It's it's a um, leftover it, from it, the Hinchcliffe era. Yeah, well, that's the thing. It's very it's it's like a Lovecraftian based under siege story. Yeah, like a, a sentient murderous blob kills a bunch of people in a lighthouse. I will also in the middle of a storm. Like it's just so creepy. On the it's similar just, note, just, I will also. And we well, get to see the Rootens, like the Rooten host. We I'll get to see also what like. honourably mention Image of the Fendal, even though or not people don't like it. Yeah, well again, this is about your opinion. This is about opinion. I think, I I think some people really will be offended. I think some people will be offended that Genesis of the Daleks was only in your honourable mentions. Yeah. Speaking of, Genesis of the Daleks hey! is, in my, is in my honourable mentions. Basically, in every Dalek story, no. No. Genesis, remem- Resurrection, Remembrance, Revelation. Revelation. Yeah. That's it. Like, ev- all the others are fine to bad. Yeah. Yeah, Dark Invasion of Earth's good. It just does some padding in it. I feel like I'd love Power <laughs> of the Daleks if it existed. Yeah, well, you can you can get a sense of it now. Yeah, so that's yeah, that's yeah. good. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, Genesis of the Darks. Uh, just what's what's Davros Michael? Michael Wisher. Wisher. Michael Wisher's performance. Terrifying. Um, obviously, obvious moments like the attack of the Dalek mutant, which is the first time we properly see one yeah, in a creepy yeah. way since um, the Daleks, when like that claw just yeah, comes out from the under the blanket. Um, and now they look even more horrific and they're like by this point because they're just sort of like organs with, with bits of limb they're just snot blobs horrifying snot uh, blobs just, just loads of stuff like Sarah and Harry in that story the yeah. obviously the con- just the scenes where it's the Doctor and Davros in dialogue together are brilliant specifically of course the like the virus the, uh, uh, yeah. conversation the virus dilemma yeah, like, that's a yes, big story. The virus it. element, that's got to be a big funny story. Like Guaranteed. that that is uh, just some phenomenal stuff in Genesis, but it's not it's not one I revisit a lot because pacing wise I do I do lose interest. Those six parters can be yeah. tough going. So it's definitely an honourable mention, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um an unearthly child. But, but just an unearthly child. Part, not, yeah. Not episodes two, three, and four, yeah. Yeah, to, like to, once you get into ten thousand years BC and everything. 
I'm I'm not as they're interested. Fine. Cave I, of Skulls. I, I, I like them well they're enough. Okay, but they're okay, they're not... but it could be done in two episodes rather than three because it becomes a we've been captured. Oh, we get away. We've been captured. Yeah. Are we going to get away? Let's get away while they're not looking. Like it's just sort of. Oh, we've been captured again. It's just sort of. Yeah. It's it's not quite right. But that first episode. And especially if you watch the pilot and then the first episode, which is the pilot completely redone, mm. it's like, yeah, this is the best version of this 22 minutes of television. It's, it's very good. It's so good. It sets up the mystery brilliantly. It's mysterious and odd. And Susan, I think Susan's at her most interesting in that first episode. Yeah. Um, yeah because yeah. she is the central mystery of that first episode. After that, she kind of just becomes a teenager. Yeah, there's no, there's nothing that otherworldly about her after that. Like first in this, episode. she's in this, she's an alien who's completely settled and happy to be a teenager in the sixties, and is yeah. loving it. He's absolutely loving it, and then it all gets taken away from her, and you can see that she's dis- she's distraught, and she doesn't want any harm to come to Ian and Barbara. And it's great, and it's the template for um, Rose as well, in that it's like this is the story of this, in this case, these people, but this is the story of this person from Earth getting pulled into this. Yeah. Um, which which is so good that um, Russell did it again for for Smith and Jones, and it works really well because of that. Like you know, our, our central character is the companion. A story so nice, they did it twice and then thrice. Yeah. <laughs> um, Revelation of the Daleks yeah. is, is is another one I, for reasons I, we again yeah. love it, love it, love it, love it. What's, what's the bounty hunter called again? The... Um, it's Orsine and his squire Bostock. They are freaking great. Yeah, and so like sort of odd like they feel so yeah. out of place but they work really well in it yeah. and it gives you, you, at this point you're like why hasn't the doctor just pimp slapped davros across the face it's like because he would never do that or see however yeah he can freaking shoot his hand off <laughs> like yeah, let's do this happen. uh tomb of the cybermen's in my honorable mentions yes it's very good I loves me some tomb of the cybermen um the time warrior I was yeah, I was debating over whether that would go on my short I think list. that's the only Santaran story in our in our lists um, um, uh, Santaran experiments on my short list Oh, of course, yeah. yeah. But again, it's because it's because Sarah Jane's introduction, like she she wins her way into sort of into the world and into the viewers' hearts, the doctors' hearts, because of the fact that she pretends to be her aunt and all this, and, yeah. and is is just she, she's so Lavinia. savvy, she's on it. Yeah, um, it's got a lot of like Doctor Who tropes, like oh we've been kidnapped, oh the alien reveal, oh mind control, oh people like sort of being ruled over in secret by an alien, like all this stuff. It's also got Doc Cotton in it though. It does, <laughs> as, as but, a it, queen. But, but again, it's just such a wonderful thing of like it, it, it's one of the few historical tropes which I still don't that that, that 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 they that they change. Like they made historicals used to be pure historicals, and then they made it so that the historical had to have an alien element. Yeah. Um, and I don't mind that when it's done like this, where it's like, it's not a, cause the later on it becomes like, oh no, the murderer is a wasp <laughs> alien. And, and like, it's that uncovering of the, oh no, the witch is a real, like, do you know what I mean? It's that uncovering. What do they call, not to, not to pick on two Gareth Roberts scripts. The best perform. Best perform. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, th- yeah. And I don't mind that. That's obviously how the modern series does it. But, um, I like how it's done in here. Like, Lynx, his ship crashes and he's making the best of that situation while the repairs are happening. Yeah. And it's such a great idea that this alien shows up and he's basically like, hi, village, I can beat the shit out of you all. Do as I say. And that, that idea of the alien invasion happening to a medieval community is is done really well in that story. And Lynx good. is a great villain. Like, he's our introduction to the Sontarans and he's great. And Percy's green jacket and that is fucking sweet. And, you know, it's just, it's... Oh, he does have a great costume. I, I love that. I love that story. It's a great introduction to Sarah Jane. It's really good. Uh, survival. Again, the first Seventh Doctor story I ever watched. Um, and just the tone. It's it's It was an instant bridge for me yeah. to start following the 80s stuff a bit more. Because I was like, oh God, this is like the modern stuff. Yeah. This is great. Um, and it's those last two. It is the Ghost Light, Curse of Fenric, Survival <clears> sort of trilogy, which does start to lean it's just sort of segue into the new series almost Ainley and his, like his freaking contacts and, and the Doctor and the Master in a really interesting place because it's not the Doctor trying to stop the Master in the middle of a giant evil world dominating no, plot no. but there is still obviously like there is the there is the arch enemy, enemy thing going on and it's just it's you know if we live like animals all that stuff if we fight like animals <laughs> we'll, we'll die, die like animals, animals. 
love it. And finally, my honourable mentions, the Time Meddler. Yes. Peter Butterworth as the meddling monk. Yes. Stephen not believing a damn thing Vicky and the Doctor are saying and be like, this is bullshit. We're not yeah. travelling in time. I don't know what you've done. Like, you've obviously just moved us somewhere. This is bullshit. We can't have travelled in time because that monk's wearing a wristwatch. And that whole thing of like, <laughs> wait, yeah, no, hang on, that's not right. Why is the monk wearing a wristwatch? Yeah. And then them starting to uncover what the hell's going on. It's the first instance we have of another another one of the Doctor's people, which at this yeah. point are unnamed, but like he has a TARDIS and he's travelling through history to commit like tiny crimes for his own benefit. Tiny but, time crimes. But he's obviously got time crimes, but he's obviously become obsessed with the idea that he can really influence events and has now decided, Do you know what? I think the Battle of Normandy and all that stuff, like the Hastings and all that, should have turned out differently. So I'm going to give someone else the edge here so that it shifts. Because I think Harold would have been a better king. Like Harold, Harold would have been a brilliant king if he was still there. And that's his entire thing. Yeah. And it's like, why are you doing this? He's just like, because I just think it should be corrected. Why not? Give it a go. Like, because you've got like a grand plan. No, I just, I think it'd be better. <laughs> so I'm going to do it. It's like, well, you can't do that, you dickhead. And it's just, it's great. Like when the Vikings <laughs> arrive at the at the monastery and, and the way the doctor sort of one-ups the monk and their relationship's really fun to watch and, and the way that he screws him up at the end by leaving him to be, to have to answer for his crimes to the village. Yeah. Because he can't use his TARDIS because the Doctor takes, like, the uh, dimensional circuits. So he opens the doors. The last time, his TARDIS is the back of the little crypt. And it's tiny inside. And it's just his face peering through the door. He's like, oh, no. <laughs> he's, he's stranded. <laughs> like, he's absolutely buggered. And it's such a great idea. And it's all that stuff. And, and just, the, just the whole, like, this is the console that, that opens the doors. That's a, um, that's a, a panda. Sheer poetry, dear boy. And the, the whole... Um, <laughs> It's a Viking helmet. Not a Viking helmet. Of course it is. What else could it be? A space helmet for a cow? Hmm? <laughs> and it's just Hartnell's playful at this point because him and Maureen O'Brien, like his and Vicky's chemistry is great yeah. and Stephen's a really fun addition because it's it's pretty much yeah, it's straight after the chase. So you're mourning Barbara and Ian not being there anymore. Yeah, yeah. And, but suddenly it's all right. The Doctor's warm and fuzzy now and, and that's, that tone's going to remain. Yeah, fuzzy, fuzzy. And I love the time meddler. Um, Don't right. we all. Here we so, go. So we don't have long. I'm on 27% battery, which gives us about 15 minutes. Well, that's okay, because my number one... Doesn't exist. Uh, is Bye, everybody! ...already been mentioned in brief. <gasps> and if you have been keeping count, you know that it is, of course, Pyramids of Mars. One Again, one of my yes. early Doctor Who memories. It is a perfect distillation of what makes not just that period of Doctor Who, but Doctor Who as a concept so compelling. It merges historical with adventure with sci-fi with mythology oh look the the the, <laughs> the egyptian gods were actually aliens and here's some mummy robots which look weird but also now there's a guy with a goat work. head like and gabriel wolf's voice in him oh, god yeah um i mean you remember you freaking remember those mummies oh, as man. daft as they look because it obviously was to just been we want them to be big and imposing so they give them giant barrel chests. I like, shall mingle with the on? mummies, but I, I shan't, shan't linger. linger. Um, but, but you remember them. Like, yeah. that silhouette is amazing. They are one of the more visually interesting Doctor Who sort of minions yeah. ever. They look great. And of course, the... Stupid, but great. <laughs> the tragedy of the Scarman brothers. Yes. Um, and the, 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 oh, the Marcus Scarman resurrected cadaver. It's a reanimated yeah. cadaver. Um, and uh, that sort of... The ghostliness of it. Um, Sutek as a villain. Sutek just... is freaking wonderful. Um, Again, a villain so nice, they use him twice? Maybe? Kind of? He's well, or, or at least allude to him yeah. like being of the same sort of being in a way, um, which is brilliant. Because they, they're not sh- they've not been shy about it. Whenever people ask about the impossible planet, they're like, so the voice of the beast is Gabrielle Wolf, same as Sutek. Is that intentional? And they just went, yes. Yes. Like, we knew he had the voice for it, and we knew that people would make comparisons, but think about it. Sutek is the Egyptian god of... He's like the Egyptian just, Satan, basically. Like, yeah, destruction and death yeah. and, and all that. Oh, yeah, and what's the beast? The being that began all of that stuff. So it sort yeah. of almost suggests that the aliens that became the Egyptian gods are maybe even also derived from the beast. A siren. And, and it's like, that's great. Like, the, the, again, continuity on a subtle level. So the future informs that story and adds more to it. Yeah. And it's just, oh God. And again, peak peak um, Doctor and Sarah Jane. <sighs> Their relationship is on top form in this. It's just beautiful. Is it straight after 
Zygons. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, it, it's weird that it doesn't... You, you sort of miss Harry, but you don't need to know Harry was just there for that story to work. No. Because they are so in tune with each other. Because you do get that that um, dynamic of Tom at his best where he flits between melancholy and manic. Yeah. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Like, he's so mopey at the beginning of the story. And then when they land in the in the priory, yeah. the old priory, it's like, oh, 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 this is this is something else. This is something new. Um, yeah, it's it's Pyramids of Mars. It's my favorite Doctor Who story of all time, at least until I decided Robots of Death is better. Um, no, what's, what what gets what puts it over Robots of Death for me? Even though that again, I think they're perfect distillations of what makes both the show as a whole and those particular periods of the show work. Is it is it's the Tom and uh, Liz dynamic? Yeah. Yeah. The fourth Doctor and Sarah Jane are just such an incredible team. And this is very few t- very few form. times do do as a companion cross over and it feel like they belong to both Doctors' yeah. eras comfortably. Yeah, yeah. Um like obviously, you know, uh, Nissa, Teague and Adric and whatnot, like they're with the fourth Doctor and then are inherited by the fifth Doctor. But you think of them, you think of the fifth Doctor. Yeah. Perry's with the fifth Doctor briefly, but Perry's definitely a sixth Doctor character. Yeah. Um Whereas Sarah Jane crosses from a damn strong season with the third Doctor in a way where you're like, these guys are great. And then crosses into into Tom and the dynamic becomes better because obviously they have more time and the chemistry can develop a bit more. Yep. And the writing at this point is very conscious of making the companion more than just the the question asker yeah. and stuff. Um, but she also like, she was that she was that good that you're like, oh yeah, Sarah Jane is a third and fourth Doctor companion. But Pyramids of, Mar- Pyramids of Mars is, is like peak these two yeah. together. Yeah. So good. God damn you. Very, God very, you, very sir. good. Christopher, inquiring minds want to know, oh. what is your number one? My number one is not the best Doctor Who story. It's not even the best one of its very own miniature genre of gonna, Doctor Who I, story. Am I going to mock you for this mercilessly? But it is... A single sitting treat. Yes. It has elements of everything that's great about Doctor Who up to that point in it. Yeah. Both um sort of as part of the of the, 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 the structure and feel of it and physically on screen. Yeah. And it's just it gives me the warmest, fuzziest feeling inside watching it. Tell me what it is. It's 1983's The Five Doctors. 20th anniversary <laughs> special. <laughs> the Five Doctors, boys and girls, is not the strongest. It's, I mean... But it. I'll be damned if it ain't the most wonderful. Herndl's horn. Yeah, we have the first Doctor played by a different actor who probably only vaguely remembers what Hartnell he's, was he's doing. He's literally never seen William Hartnell. He's never even seen a picture of him. <laughs> like that's what comes across anyway yeah. and yet when Susan's part of the story Carol Ann Ford sells it like you believe that that's her grandfather because of how she sells it yeah it screws up like what's going on with Susan if you think about it yeah but it's fine you could you could consider this the button this is the he saw yeah. the one more time um thing uh it's I'm not a big fifth doctor fan or like of his era in mm-hmm. particular, and yet I love Tegan in this. I think Tegan is great in this. Um, Ainley, <laughs> dirty bastard. A world without the Doctor. Scarcely worth thinking, thinking about. about. Ainley is. <laughs> oh, he's so. Ainley's good. having a ball in this, and I think it's because he knew as an actor he was about to play off of at least potentially before they blocked the casting. Yeah, every Doctor. Yeah, the the one thing that this story is missing for me. Well, there's a big teeth and curl shaped yeah. hole in the story. I say it's the one thing this story is missing. I'm not massively <laughs> keen on the fifth, on the the fifth, on the five doctors. But I get why people love it because it is. It was also the first DVD Doctor Who story because it was in that first BBC range of just yeah. here's twenty BBC programs on DVD. It is also and it, it began the design like because all those all those DVDs are hard, the top half of the box was silver with yeah. the title of the show printed in it in big. So it was like all the fills and horses, Blackadder and all that stuff. 
as this one was the first one, and that sets up what the DVDs look like from that point on. Because they just decided, right, we'll keep the silver thing and the title at the top, and we'll we'll start putting pictures in the bottom. But Don't like put roundels on it. But because of that, it's the one I I rewatched the most. Yeah, and reaffirmed yeah. to young me why I liked what I'd seen of Doctor Who. But like you say, it's also... Because it was all there. There's reminders one... of it there. The quirky personalities, the idea that the lead keeps changing and yeah. yet the show feels like the same show. The, the idea that Sarah Jane needs a rope to rescue her from a small incline. Yes, that's hilarious. Like you've got... All, like, that, all that would have needed was the camera to be tilted. That's like all love that it, would have taken. Love it or hate it, you've got to admire the camp charm of this. It's camp as balls. It is so camp. It, it sort of continues the rule set up in the third do- the three Doctors of like, yeah, uh, the, the, the previous incarnations won't remember this the same way. No. Uh, so that so that when they hit... They won't remember it by the time they get to the later one. Yeah. To, to preserve the timeline and everything. So because of that, there are interactions that don't make too much sense. There's the, I mean, there's a bit where, uh, oh God, is it Jamie and is it Zoe by that point? Yeah, Jamie and Zoe, yeah. Sorry, um, uh, like, like, don't do it, Doctor, don't go through it, all this. And he's like, no, uh, the time rolls ratio on memory of me. And that's how, and he just proves that it's them because they wouldn't remember him. Yeah. But then there's also that question of like, oh, hang on, why do they look different? Why do they look older? Why would you necessarily know about... Yeah. Huh, okay, fair enough. And then and the, the third Doctor acknowledging what his next incarnation looks like. Yeah. But but you could gauge that's just from how Sarah Jane's pointing to her face. And she's like, but when I last saw you, you were... You were all... It confirms that K-9 and company definitely happened. Oh, yeah. Because Sarah Jane... No and one K-9 remembers it, but it happened. K-9 and Sarah Jane's like first shot of the story is like, yep, yeah, that's, is that's it like, K-9 and company. Is it like... There's that lovely gag with a little thing like, uh, do not... Do not um, to, uh, feed the dog or whatever it is on, on the oh, side yeah, posts, like, yeah. like people have outside their gates but it's got a picture of canine on it and he's at, he's at the railing of the gate just like mistress mistress and you're just like that is so weird there's of course the Raston warrior robot <gasps> or as I call it Bay. and the, the I freaking love the Raston warrior say robot say one of his bloody Cybermen say one of his bloody Cybermen uh, <laughs> the Cybermen are great in it the the um oh there's so much fun the the, the hopscotch shit with the chessboard, like the master takes advantage. The master does what the master does best when he's not in charge of a situation. He wheedles his way out of it to take charge of the situation. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, and and he does it so well in this. Uh, the whole puzzle. There's there's the old school like forcing education thing in the mathematical formula to get across that floor. Have yep. you seen his pie? Hernal, <laughs> um, <laughs> For all his many, many as faults in that as performance, pineapple is entertaining as hell to watch, and it's because of moments like the pineapple yeah. and the goodness me, Susan, it's the tardy. They're just all these, all these little <laughs> things. Troughton, Troughton as the second Doctor meeting the Brigadier at his retirement party. Yes. And and being like, oh, well done on, on Brig- becoming Brigadier and all this. And and him being like, but hang on, though, when I last saw you, like, I wasn't... Yeah. And he's sort of... Well, he was when he last saw him, but it's the whole yeah. thing of, like, I think they imply that the three Doctors hasn't happened for the second Doctor yet, even. And it's just... It's, well, he wouldn't remember it anyway. Well, yeah, you go. But then just all these little things that they talk about, the whole... Like, they, ref- they reference adventures, like Simon the Yeti, the Terrible Zodin. And you're like, wait, what's that one? Yeah. So even in that moment, they're going, we're gonna... We're gonna suggest other shit that's happened. So you're like, wait, what? Um, and I love it. I mean, that stuff is br- his fur coat again. Oh, that ridiculous brilliant. fur coat. I love it. The de- the death zone, the- or basically some dales in Yorkshire. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like the quarry. <laughs> like the, the Ra- Tower of Razalon, like the, the rhyme, but you know, um, the above and the middle, below, and like the three different ways to get in. Like yep. you get a Yeti cameo, you get a Dalek cameo. Um, the rest of the Warrior Robots camp is Christmas, but I love it. Yeah, uh, Barusa and uh, the begin like the the setting up of Razalon and and you seek immortality, <laughs> <laughs> all that shit, and, and the fact that the Doctor wins by like just just sheer force of will, like they all come together. Yeah, the, the, the very unfortunate that they had to do it, but decently executed way to write out Tom Baker because yeah. essentially they approached him and went. 20th anniversary, and he went, I stopped filming a year and a half ago. I don't feel like it's like long enough since I did I'm it to come to it. Yet. Yeah, we basically, he basically 
said, yeah, I've, I've, it's too soon. And they're like, well, we can't help when the 20th anniversary is. And all those press pictures of every, of all the actors with the wax work of Tom. Yes, oh my God. But it works because it, it sort of, it almost, it plays on the viewer's fondness for that Doctor. Yeah. Because they use footage from the, at that point, impossible, we're never going to ever see any version of this ever. Yeah. Sharda using the punting stuff from Cambridge, all that footage with him and Romana, and they make it work with the the uh, time eddy or whatever it's called. The they make it work. The time scoop. Time scoop. That's it. They make it work. Um, that it's like grabbed him as he's stumbling on the boat and everything, and and and, and it makes you as a viewer go, oh no, because they established that he's in he's in danger. Yeah. And only because he's trapped where he is because they can't he gets stuck and they can't get him out. That's the only reason the fifth Doctor isn't completely eradicated and is able to start trying to save the day. Yeah. Because like, as his past incarnation, which is a great idea, like his past incarnations are being removed from their respective times in a way that could screw up how his his life has gone up to that point. The fifth Doctor begins to sort of feel like he's fading away. Because it's like, well, of course he is, because stuff that wasn't meant to happen and didn't happen to him has now happened. And it's going to affect his life. It's like the Marty McFly photograph thing. It's great. <laughs> And the fact that they've got the most tranquil place in the universe for Turlock to do some sketching, and it's just misty and miserable as fuck. But they sell it. You're it's like, okay, it's tranquil. Um, they sell it. And you know, you mean you're going to go on the run from your own people in a rickety old TARDIS? <laughs> Why not? After all, I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> just breathe, Peter! Bruce, breathe. Is, Bruce is a great Boo Hiss villain. Um, I love a Boo Hiss villain. It, again, in terms of long form continuity, it sets up a plot point in time and the Doctor, like the thing that connects him to Gallifrey is the freaking the Master's uh, like return switch that he's given. Like yeah. it pops up at the end of the Eleventh Doctor's era, so it's little continuity thing that's not gross. And it's like when you rewatch Five Doctors, you go, "Oh, that comes to play like six incarnations later. That's yeah. really cool." Because um, of course, the Third Doctor takes it off the Master as leverage to make sure he doesn't run away. Um, there's just little stuff Bessie driving around the death zone the idea that Bessie is on Gallifrey is such a, a, a fun idea and, why not and, and why not pineapple why and um, oh I just I, I adore it I Barusa's bizarre fate which then gets really yeah. really interestingly expanded on in the in the, the I like it but I know a lot of people don't um, BBC books uh, Engines of War the, the War Doctor story okay um, it's, a, it's a it's a backdoor sequel to the Five Doctors Okay. Because it specifically explains Razalon's involvement in the Time War and what happened post the Five Doctors. Uh, Ari, Barusa, and Razalon. It's great. Yeah. Um, it's, there's also a lot of stuff in there that really doesn't work. It doesn't do anything to help the whole... This War Doctor doesn't seem like a nasty person at all. Because <laughs> he's sort of like that briefly in it, and then he's being really nice. And you're like, oh, for God's sake. He's yeah. the one we never speak about. Really? Because it seems like he's just like the rest of you. <laughs> <laughs> like he's, he's just like the rest of you but he's just a bit more sad yeah um so yeah i i really like the five doctors it's got that warm anniversary feel to it it's feature length uh it's bonkers it's probably the closest the franchise has had to a to a movie movie, movie. yeah yeah um i i think the anniversary special and the multi-doctor story is done far better in places like the three doctors and day of the doctor um Dave the Doctor doesn't really hold up as a story when you begin to analyse it, and it is a bit of wank. I wonder why. But it is a really fun bit of spectacle. Yeah. And, and yeah, it's yeah. a fun multi-Doctor story. There's some fun in there. Um, so, yeah, just like, I, The Five Doctors is, is warm. And bonus, if you've got the special edition version of it, look for the Easter egg, because the Easter egg is a David Tennant and Phil Collinson audio commentary recorded as they were going into production on the 2009 specials. <laughs> So they're, Very good. they're currently making the show whilst they're talking about one of their favourite old ones that they really enjoy. Very good. It's great. Um, but the real question is, boys and girls. Yes. What's your top three, let's say? Yeah, give us your top, top three classic Doctor Who serials. Give us your top threes. Yeah, we'd like to hear from you on that one, you swines. So, uh, big damn contact, even. Big damn contact at gmail.com. Yeah. Spelt contact. contact. Big damn contact at gmail.com. Email us, let us know what your top three, in any particular order, Doctor Who classic serials. Yep. Um, and a little bit about why for each one, because we'd yeah, like yeah. to know. Uh, and also, if you want to tweet at us, we highly encourage it because we want to know how excited you are for the premiere of Series 11. The premiere, which we will be talking about next, next time. So, at Big Damn Cast on Twitter. 
Uh, you catch the occasional bit of nonsense on twitch.tv slash bigdamnstream. Adventures in backlogging, new episodes, uh, and the occasional Big Damn Love are now available on the Big Damn channel on YouTube. I have no idea where I'll be, what game I'll be playing by this point. But something. Yeah. And, I might have uh, finished Transformers Devastation by the time this comes out. It's alright, because by the time we reach October 7th, uh, our memories will reset, so we'll have no memory of, of these right, events. Right, okay, so okay, cool. So as to not disrupt the cool. timeline. All right, cool, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What? That's how it works, right? Oh my goodness, Chris! It's, it's the, the TARDIS! Good for your bones.